We'll let you know, I guess. Alright. <laughs> Fuck. Okay, thank you. So, we're gonna be dissecting this image, uh, all the way down from the sketch phase to the complete phase. It's a, like a melange of uh, various sources and, and methods. Uh, generally, it's kind of a, what we would call like a cell-shaded style. Cell-shaded kind of essentially means that you have um, blocks of color or blocks of, uh, of an object or something, uh, which you sort of fill in. At least that's how I understand it. You fill in with the details and, and sort of you're, you're using like masks to, to set boundaries uh, for each object. I'm getting lost a little bit in my own interface. So you have this element here that, yeah, um, pretty, like, uh, the use of this many layers, though, isn't really something that is necessarily for uh, digital painting, per se, just this particular style. Um, I've seen amazing paintings done with just one layer over a background, or just one layer completely including the background. So uh, digital painting really is about finding the, um, the what is like most optimal to you personally um, from everything such as like the, the power of your PC to the peripherals that you're using, your Wacom tablets. Um, uh, uh, definitely your program as well. Uh, I don't really want to talk uh, or spend too much time on the subject of programs because uh, I want to stay as broad as possible to just stick into what is like theory, not technical uh, or mechanics of, uh, of each individual like, program. But um, the tools I'm using uh, for this painting, I'm somewhat confident are available currently in Photoshop at least. Uh, I've been told all of them are available in Krita. I uh, don't know that for sure. Um, and the weirdest one, honestly, is going to be this this blur tool that uh, it does like special, does very special things. Um, the reason I personally like to use Clip Studio is because it's incredibly um, customizable like for the interface. Uh, I can change the command bars up here, uh, like uh, the floating menus are like, really nicely organized. I can have the floating menus either docked or um, free-floating, as I have them here. Now, I personally prefer them free-floating because you know they can stay nice and pretty where they are right now. But if I need to get in, like get real tight on what I'm doing, like the HUD is zooming in, we are like getting really down to the core and uh, and focusing on something. I like to have this here. Um, probably It would probably be best if I stayed loose, almost always. But, uh, but this, is, this is just simply like, it's the means I've found the most success with, um, you know, everyone is different uh, when it comes to painting. It's, an inc it's a very, very subjective um, uh, subject most of the time. You do have to make the decisions though and the, and the commitments to be representational or um, abstract and uh, like leaning heavily on idealization instead of like naturalism. So those are what's, in my opinion, what's going on the most uh, in any given like digital artist direction is their, their personal influences and philosophies. Uh, not really as much about what programs they're using, what uh, techniques they're using. Um, those are kind of, those are really only interested in me if I want to um, end up like pulling some element of theirs uh, and feeding it into my own method, um, which I do quite often. Um, I guess, should I, is anyone, should I go a little bit about my background? Snap, anyone? Is if that, you want. <laughs> is that interesting or relevant? What do we think? Sure, why not? Would love to learn more about you. All right, cool. Now that I've got your permission. <laughs> uh, so my name is Petra. Uh, I uh, 
am a 30 year old uh, independent, uh, geez, independent uh, freelance uh, illustrator. I primarily work in not safe for work content, or at least that's been uh, where I'm coming from contextually. So I have a, a heavy interest in uh, anatomy, um, posing. Uh, I've spent, I've actually stolen, even though I'm not an animator in any sense, I've actually stolen quite a lot of things from animators uh, to, con to incorporate into my pieces, like, like ideas about motion, squashing and stretching, um, using really abstract forms when you're trying to like show motion. Uh, uh, and, and like little bits like that, that have come into, to influence it. So, um, I studied at, uh, the VCU, uh, which is the Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, uh, and where I was like, uh, I was trained as a, uh, a, a communications artist, which was just fancy talk for illustrator. Um, but we also uh use typefaces we learn a little bit about typefaces uh we kind of have a publication uh uh emphasis uh or a little bit of a uh, graphic design a little particular um so i pro oh yeah i probably this is i guess this is obvious i primarily work in uh anthropomorphics so the furry fandom is is like my uh my comfort zone <laughs> my my harbor uh and i've been drawing uh uh content for it for roughly uh, actually like no uh, no like the whole time so ever since i was about about 16 um uh so I'm actually not as good at drawing human heads. So, you know, you focus in one thing, you really go for it. And like, there there comes to be this like imbalance sometimes, uh, even when like, probably shouldn't be. And that is like, that is probably why it's really, really good to do what y'all have been doing here so far. And that is to learn like, a, a, like universal structures and, and methods to build, to build things. Although, that is more applicable to drawing um, where you need to have a very strong grasp of your fundamentals, um, like from proportions to uh, perspective, um, but uh, especially no, for painting. Huh? Oh, um, my bad, mic was on. No worries. Um, so, uh, so like, all of those though become like especially important for certain types of digital for, or, or of any painting. Um, but uh, perspective in 3D forms is like really important for what we're doing here, which is like representing characters in space, uh, handling objects, et cetera. So if you have like a small class on abstract uh, painting though, because honestly, um, if I had to, if I had to think of the like where most of my like lessons, art lessons have come from, they've usually I think the ones that have come from learning about abstractions actually outnumbers uh those for um for like for realism, like classes in realism. So like I've learned about color from like study like really early on from studying like Rothko. Won't do too much color theory in here um, this time because I'm 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 not prepared to teach it. Painting is also like enormous, so there's a ton of stuff to cover. Um, but uh, I think that I think that about does it. I think we should I think we should probably dive into this. Uh, so everyone has a copy of this, uh, the the painting, the Space Bunny Girl. Um, if you'd like to follow along, uh, I'd encourage that. Uh, you don't have to, of course. So uh, while we're going through all the various things in here uh, that I want to talk about, I'm going to try to, like, when I can, I'll do a little demo over here. So exactly what we're talking about from, like, in a sphere. Uh, and I'd, I'd suggest if you are following along and you want to, like, draw along, uh, pick, pick, like, draw a circle uh, as your sketch, and we're going to try to, we're going to try to turn those into spheres by the end of it. Uh, like, 
yeah. <laughs> I guess. Cool. Maybe we'll make one of these things. Uh, um, so, starting in the sketches. Turn that off. Here we go. So, initially, this sketch comes from like a collection of heads from my sketchbook from ages ago. Oh, shit. What? Real quick. Uh, before we go into this, I have gotten into the habit of using, like, of creating a kind of digital sketchbook for, uh, for each month. And what I mean by a digital sketchbook is just a file that has a ton of sketches from that particular month. And then you just make a new file every month. Um, you can definitely get to the point where this will become taxing on your computer if, you're, if you have like tons and tons and tons of sketches and maybe like a few paintings tossed in here into the files. Uh, but I find it really, really handy to have a bulk amount of sketches from each month because as has, has happened over here, um, having the archivability of just throwaway sketches instead of like getting rid of them completely and forever, uh, some of these crappy sketches, like, what is that? Uh, ah, uh, really, really simple stick figures. Some of these things can uh, find new life in uh, a new project. Uh, it's, it's really nice to have these around. Um, in case you need, say, uh, as is the case here, you can see if I just need a head for a demonstration, and maybe we don't want to draw it all the way, or like spend too much time figuring it out. So, and that that's that's exactly what's happened with this piece. I've like gone back to an old sketch, uh, take and. Uh, built the rest of the piece from that. It can get a bit hazardous. Um, like, it's it's usually better to start with the complete idea if you can. Uh, uh, but sometimes really great ideas can come from a cutaway of something, like a small part of a puzzle, rather than um, you know having the whole thing answered for you already. Uh, the catch is, though, as with everything is that it might take more time to, to do certain steps than other steps. So there's always going to be some kind of like exchange there. You know, do I, do I spend six more hours in like just figuring out the ide ideation phase? Uh, or do I just grab something and move on to the next? Uh, there's, it's, it's never a clear cut answer. But, okay, so take that head and get rid of all of these layers because we're not ready, not yet. But we'll do it one by one and say, like, or not, because these are all, these are all um, clipped, so they're serving as masks. But there we go. Lighting effects. So we're climbing up, we're going through like the top layers at the top and the, the ones underneath all of them at the bottom. Uh, and then the whole way back is this. So this is a rough sketch, uh, or I shouldn't say rough, I shouldn't use that word. It, it's very, it, clearly it's very like clean for a, for like a sketch, um, but it's, it's still rough as in like there's there's exposed lines uh down here on the uh, construction lines down here on the arms um a common thing like I'll, I'll hear online uh with people who use uh or artists who use like uh you know really fine lines and things is that uh there's a sort of mystique or a, a like a loss when they take their works from uh sketch phase to ink phase um inking just real quickly being the process of like going over uh like your outline with a with an actual pen and yeah everything everyone probably 
or in here. But just like that process. Certainly, this is like one way you can do your images. Um, I, I I have to believe just because I'm one of these people, but like I I can't stand doing this. This is ma this is madness to me. I can't sit. Look at this. I can't. I'm not moving. I'm just stuck on the nose. And then, oh god, that's it's off. Oh ah, but the oh the line weight. Now I have to think about the ah. Uh, and so I'll, I'll end up becoming like personally. I'll end up becoming like one of those scratchy artists that like doctors the line for every centimeter um and like this takes forever and is agonizing on your hand you end up with like like carpal tunnel um <laughs> I, i'm exaggerating plenty of people use this stuff and it's fine so if you if you're of that vocation then please do continue doing what you love um i guess like does anyone want me to talk about like how I like how I do lines? I guess. Yeah. I no, no. You know what? Yeah, I am going to talk about it. Um, so, like, I don't really. Shucks. Where to start with this? Let me think for a second. All right, we're going to start deep. <laughs> so. Um, Oh, there is a tendency when talking about digital painting to think of these tools as being real life counterparts. And it's absolutely assert, absurd because none of these pencils in here behave like a pencil. None of these things look actually look like they they're they're stamp based often than not the ones that are like where they have textures, the tile. Um, that's great for a certain kind of painting. Um, like, uh, but um, like if you really, if your goal is to get something that looks as close to real life painting as possible, like if you want your digital painting to look like an oil painting, like a real oil painting, that's cool. Um, and I've seen beautiful pieces like like done that way, but I don't think it's like I, I don't really subscribe to the idea of treating these things as like what they are named or thinking of them as what they are named. Um, I, I, I personally believe that digital art, uh, digital painting definitely, um, has very, very little to do, like, or is very poorly analogous to, uh, to real painting. Um, and that it's a little absurd to call like this watercolor that I use for line art a watercolor brush, um, but th like then again, you're listening to someone who basically has only ever used smooth or hard round brush, the hard round brush. So it's just a uh, circle. Um, I, I, of course, I use other uh, other tools often. It's a little bit of an exaggeration, but. Um, that's the one I use the like the most, uh, and I also like I'm also not like I I can do the line thing, but it's kind of infuriating. Like I said, I lose my patience with it. So what I just do, I like I try to keep my lines nice and open, but I don't pinch them at the end. Um, I like to have the gradient instead, and I like this end to be about the same size as like right here in the middle. So same, like same size all throughout the thing. Um, I find that the taper, the, the tapering effect that you get with some brushes is really distracting. Um, uh, like you get super, super focused on the, on the, like the finesse work of uh, like a, 
you know, pushing and pulling enough to, to, to click the sensors in your stylus over to the right pressure sensitivity while also while also dragging your hand against like a glass or I just I find it to be like a weird. So I do kind of paint my lines, but I try to keep them uh, nice and long. And whenever I find interesting shapes uh, that I personally like, I'll pull those out. And this process, I think, becomes a little bit like painting. Um, but it's lines. Uh, but that's it's, it's totally applicable uh, for this medium. Like you can use drawing techniques for your painting. As I, it's kind of true, and, and like that's definitely true. Excuse me, in uh, in traditional painting as well, you you do like I said at the top. Like you do take a lot of your um, you, you gain quite a lot from having good drawing skills in painting. We'll often like use like lines and shit in in paintings instead of just like stamps or uh or broad brush strokes um but uh yeah there's i uh i put a lot of emphasis on 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 flow with lines and like even throughout my anatomy and uh like i kind of touched on this earlier but uh between a um between a representational artist and a um, uh, and an idealism artist, uh, I fall like way not not that far. Maybe like maybe like right here. That's the middle. So. I will still think like use things like anatomy, like good practice of anatomy. Um, wait, this is this is on the wrong side. Shit. Um, like pr proper perspective. Uh, but I will throw in some abstractions throw in uh, like cheat sometimes uh, if uh, if if something in anatomy is preventing me from getting something that's really really beautiful uh, and effective um, I will usually prioritize like the the beautification part of it uh, as long as it doesn't break the the integrity I guess of uh, uh, of the rest of the form it has before often in the past and I'm kind of treating it as a uh, like a you know, the, the learning process is with anything, you know, you have failures, you have successes, and there's probably a, yeah, like a, a good base between uh, to land on. Uh, okay. Uh, so once you have something like this, like with your lines uh, that have been like somewhat cleaned up, what you, what you really want in an underpaint in a in a in a sketch or a drawing to turn into a painting is uh, enough information, so just data, to help you have already like go into the painting with a with a solid understanding of how the lighting is going to work. So, a couple shadows here. There's some like you want to have an indication of form, of three dimensionality of shape length like of shapes in space so like this ear everything needs to be as as close and and and, and ready to go as possible it can still be loose but you you need that you need plenty of data is, is i guess like essentially what i'm just saying um so once you have enough data Oopsie do. I oops, okay, I made a big I broke my thing. That's fine though. Sorry. 
So this one comes from a little while down the tube, but we'll go ahead and go ahead and just like flatten it to black. That'll be fine. Uh, I oh gosh, I forgot to talk about. Um, whenever you open. Let me just show you all something real quick. Whenever you open like a new document, you're getting ready to go. Um, get into the habit, or I really suggest uh, getting into the habit, not using a white background. This hurts after after a while. This is painful. Doesn't matter what the what the, what the color is back here. This is what you're staring at most of the time. Your attention is completely in this terrifying uh, and uh, and uh, damaging like never-ending whiteness um so i suggest going about half tone there's a there's there are good reasons there are other good reasons for this besides just a, that's just like a painful a painful experience but uh like when you're at this uh at value uh as like for your background you can have lots of of you have a ton of range of variation in your values talk more about those at some point, I guess. But you can go all the way to, to, to black. You can go all the way to searing white for highlights. Um, I find that I find this like way better for, for sketching. Uh, it's not just comfortable, but functional as well. And, you know, they come out pretty good looking, uh, I think, on a, on a great background than a white one. So save your eyes. Uh, Anyway, uh, so what I've added here after the line work is a um, is just a solid layer of of one color plus some some brown corrections that came from uh, came from further down the thing. You know what? We're gonna fix that rule as part hey, of the uh, uh, hey yes. Petra? What's up? Yeah. I I hate to interrupt class, but. Uh... The secondary stream uh, cut out. We uh, something happened to him, and uh, a lot of people can't see the stream now. Oh, nuts! Uh... Does anyone else want to like volunteer to stream Discord? Uh, uh, I can leave Petra's if someone needs to join. Hmm. You just uh, you stream the application uh, if you're on a computer. Fully queue? You can? You offer? Can someone stream in Classroom Overflow? Well, we're currently not reaching caps, so I don't see the point in going to Overflow right now. How's it going, y'all? It feels super, like, all over the place. You're doing good. Really? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, Definitely don't have questions, y'all. If you, if I'm, if I'm missing something. Oh, you don't have the rest. power. Yeah. Um, I can stream, but I got some stuff in the background that's probably not going to be good for class. Well, if you just stream application, it'll, it won't, we won't hear anything else other than Discord audio. That and I uh, also can't stream. Oh, are you wanting to stream something else? No, I'm trying to stream Petros, but the thing is, I can't stream it because I don't have uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Is it the Very permission? Permission. Wait, yeah. do you, have you guys um, not done it yet? Hold on, let me see. You should you should be able to stream in here, uh, unless you have like, do you need to have a certain role? Hold on. Okay, can you guys see it from mine? Let's check. Can you see Petra's stream? Petra, go back into your stream. Yeah, let's see if we can see it from my stream. We can see it. It's viewable? Great. Okay. Uh, I, don't think I'll just... uh, huh? I don't think you need to stream audio, Yeah, yeah, yeah. though, because it, it has like an echo effect. Is there a way for me to turn off audio? Uh, yeah, I'll just yeah. bam. 
Okay. Hello, hello, hello. Testing, testing. I can still hear myself. You can really? Hear yeah. End. You can like turn the volume yeah. down to the stream on your end, Stevie. Oh, oh I just true. muted it. That's crazy. Okay, that's true. Okay, okay never mind. Never mind. It's good. Volume. It's good. You can just turn off the volume from the stream when you're watching it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah so you can keep going, Petra. Thank you so much, y'all. Um, yeah, no problem. So we have a little issue here. Uh, got some incorrect color, but the the shape of it seems to be like inside the lines, and uh, I don't. It may not need it. There's two ways you can correct this. Basically, you can lock the layer here, uh, lock the alpha. Um, or the transparent uh, pixels on the layer, uh, which means it's it's a lot like a mask. Uh, you won't be able to paint outside of uh, the clipped area or the um, uh, the locked area. Uh, this doesn't though use a mask, and I have no idea if that's better or worse. It's probably fine either way. Um, creating a mask is uh, it would be this process. So go down here. You need a selection though before that. So. Oh gosh, selection tool. We're talking about the selection tool. Oh my god, there's so many things. Um, uh, oh gosh. So you could do the selection thing where you you like you isolate it, selection, you know, move it, create mask this way. And same effect now. Uh, if I turn off the alpha lock. Still can't paint outside of it. You can do this either way. Uh, I see a lot of Photoshop users preferring uh, the masking method. Uh, there's definitely things that uh, masking can do that this probably can't, probably. Uh, but for now. So, yeah. So, with the lock, my preferred way, you can just go over here and recolor those pixels. Um, uh, with a big ass brush, and uh, but if say like if you have this happen inside of like some line work, uh, where or for whatever reason where you you like just this isn't like a good option, um, or you have like a let's say let's say you've constructed multiple characters, uh. And you are a super cool guy, uh, animator person. Uh, and like, you know that by, uh, wait a second, let's, let's make, you know that by coloring your character's line work differently, you can have an easier time distinguishing them uh, from one another on the canvas. So I'm going to color with the same method, the uh, alpha lock. Transparency lock, whatever. Um, color one, one red. Color this one. Color this one blue. Classic red, red. Jesus, it's, it's, it's blue. And they're fighting over the their like their soul. Um, but because you have one that's blue and constructed over here, you can really easily see how they relate to red. And maybe you can reposition them if you need to that way, uh, or redraw them. Or honestly, like the best thing that this is for is making sure that your line work doesn't get merged onto the same layer where you have to like go in and then start like carefully excising the now converged twins from once to another, whilst inside the womb. Just like, bit by bit like that. You don't want to be in this position. So uh, can say, actually, yeah, it was, it, even for your, you animation people, it, I, like, I see this working a lot. Um, maybe consider something like that, I guess. I don't know. I've never animated a day in my life, y'all, so I'm tired. I never made it past the ball. So I'll let that back in. 
You know, those were probably important though for the for the rest of the piece. So, like maybe we have just created a uh, call it a time movie. Okay, whatever. So, clip uh, has function right here. You can you can clip uh, layers, like top layers, down to uh, the layers below. You can do this too in Photoshop. I forget what they call it though. Um, but uh, when they're clipped to the layer below, uh, they will only the pixels that will display are only those that are overlapping the original uh, or the, the the bottom layer or the layer they're clipped to. So that works by clipping it here. You can that way you can um, like go crazy by painting over it and just clip it down and everything is in place. You don't have to erase anything. Super, super quick and easy. Uh, but um, the next part of this process, let's see, we've got the base layer down. So now we're going to start adding clipping, or like clipping masked layers. You know what? Maybe that's what they call it in photo. Uh, to the stack above the the base the the base color so and uh in doing this we're we're only going to use we're going to use a solid color just to start off with uh for each of the for each for each hue ha um uh, for each hue that you want the um the the base that you want to use for the base color for the the painted area that you're going to be working in. So, really quickly. Um, so here we have a color wheel. These are your hues. The outside, just real, real quick and dirty. These are the hues. They're the the like the saturated, fully saturated, uh, fully lit um, saturation. Speaking of which, is kind of the the graying, the uh, the amount of uh, in painting, it's like it's it's pigments or um, in traditional painting uh, or original pigment, you could be mixing it, whatever. Um, but uh, going from t like completely gray uh, through here, that's your that's your saturation. Your values, meanwhile, are the gradation from uh, black to white. Uh, this is an So, well, I only went to art school, not science. Um, so, value, black and white, how much it's lit uh, as well, and, and then saturation, so graying to full, full color. Uh, you want to pick when we're picking a base, kind of like the boring version of the color that we eventually want to get. So, we have, if we want like if we want this space suit to be a really super cool like sleek black, um, yeah, like super, super slick. Got like racing stripes. Um, like we're we're gonna want to start with uh, with something that's drab and and dull, uh, as we all start in life, uh, and then just build off of that. Kind of like how we we were like selecting uh, like a grayscale or uh, the the half tone, the 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 intermediate gray for the background, so we're not hurting our eyes, and we're making it easier to perceive value on the canvas. Ha ha. Uh, it's also like saturation. Too. We also see, we can perceive basically everything gray. Um, we, we do the same, the same idea is true here inside of, of, uh, of the base color. So pick something that's sort of in the middle. That way we can go up or down, saturated or, or more so. Um, 
you if the, the depending on how depending on the material the actual color of it so you could, you could end up with something that's like really really dark yeah uh and this might be a good time to say uh rarely is anything in the world totally desaturated really white it's it's rare if like not it like never happens unless it's being lit by by something meant to be like but the hue you can't really like white light will just come like you'll just get a like the bounce will just be a hue uh so when we have something like an all black character or an all white character uh it drives me insane because like white just doesn't exist in on characters like naturally like this isn't a thing and i can't this is so much harder to work with than adding a little bit of a little bit of hue in there uh and it looks more natural it looks like it's actually being lit by environments you know like nothing so try try to avoid that blues are also very often composed of or blacks black uh, uh elements are are usually actually composed of a lot of blues um but uh but they can definitely be like a warm warm dark to them instead of like a cold cold side y'all thought it was a dark joke they didn't um <clears throat> So we add a base color for all of the elements that we want separated. <coughs> this uh, is interesting, yeah. So I better that. Uh, yeah. So uh, this base color ended up like changing completely over to red in the process of painting uh, the piece. So I changed it from blue. Thought it was going to be blue originally. Um, switched it from blue to a red. This red is being lit more by the eventual magical elements uh, around her. So, like, all that. The idea, though, like, uh, by the way, is that uh, the character is... Okay, we're gonna have to turn all the layers on again. The character is um, a mage number one that may not may or may not come through, and she is offering uh, a little bit of atmosphere to you, uh, and it's through this like magical process that I have kind of I've been building a world around called Halomancy where uh, you have these, like, people who have these like, magical orbs or, or, like, flat dishes usually behind their heads, just like they did in, like, uh, medieval paintings with holy figures. Uh, and they're, like, space mages, and they can, they, they have crazy, uh, or reality. Um, uh, and just the spell, yeah, the spell is, uh, like, the idea is that they're, like, in space or something didn't quite make it that far in the two days I had to do it. So, uh, they're in space or something, she's lost her helmet, so she's casting this, like, atmosphere, oxygen, this breathing uh, uh, spell, and she's offering uh, you the same thing. Wow. Uh, so, there's this halo thing, right? The reason I'm telling you this is because there's this halo element that's creating some light here. Uh, and then there's this, like, influence of the atmosphere back here as well that I kind of think should have some kind of, like, a brightening effect at least, even if it's not, the, even if it didn't turn out to be the same color as, uh, as what's in here. Um, so the halo is creating this light, uh, and her being in, like, a totally separate environment, uh, kind of, like, it's, it's like it's reality-bending bubble. Uh, I've made the base coat see I've made the base color for the uh for flight suit um 
a less saturated kind of red than uh, in a darker uh, red than the portion that is being illuminated. Although, as you should be able to see on the color wheel, if I select the eyedropper tool, and I get away, get rid of the effects here. It's about on the same hue. So this, paying attention to this right here, it's about the same hue. What's changing the most is its saturation. It's going from here to here. It's also getting slightly brighter. So here to here. Um, the reason I do that instead of like making this instead of instead of uh like starting here and uh just going going down you can do this um that you can like you can do this you're not breaking any rules like right so like <laughs> but it's 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 usually like more natural i guess to 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 desaturate it uh, for natural looking. Uh, let's see. Let's actually though. I'm curious. Let's fucking see. Like, so we'll start here with this. And then we're just going to drop. We're just going to drop the value and just. It's not falling too, too. Yeah, we yeah, start to lose information by just dropping value a little. There we go. And figure out where it was again. Not a question, but uh, you're doing a good job. Oh, shut the fuck. <laughs> Thank you. Am I making sense? I say so. Okay. Yeah, is it, yeah. That feels is right. Oh, awesome. Is this like super new or is this uh, like old news? I mean, I'm an art it's god, so I mean, nothing you're saying right. is new. All right, all right. All right. Hey, right. but it's not bad to reaffirm the fundamentals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're all, we're all exactly. Here. We're all here because we already know everything, obviously. <laughs> But uh, uh yeah, you're if, doing you're, great. if you're Thanks. curious about what program she's using, it's Clip Studio, and uh, it's fifty dollars. Uh, it sometimes goes down to on sale and stuff. Twenty. Like I I picked up mine for twenty dollars on a on a sale once, and it's been like there. There's also an iPad version, which I love. I think the iPad version is worth the the subscription cost, but the iPad version costs a subscription instead of a, a one time payout. I have it downloaded, but I haven't tried it yet. Doing. Do you think it's user friendly? Um, that's a good question. I I I want to like jump up and down and scream yes, but if I'm thinking back, uh, well, you know, yeah. If uh, if you can, if you know about the tool that you want to get out of it, it's usually it's usually there. And you you're just kind of like learning interface stuff at that point. It's it's like I don't struggle as much with this with Clip Studio, uh, Clip Studio's UI as I do in other programs. Um, that's kind of a philosophical point as well. I uh, I tend to prioritize what so like you can learn technique for you can learn theory and you can learn technique, and it's really difficult to learn both at the same time. Uh, technique is is like all the tools that are involved in art in art making. So there's the the like the the programs you use, the peripherals, etc. Uh, pencils, the papers, whatever. Um, 
And then the theory is like how to construct a figure, how to use perspective, how to, you know, adhere to color theory or, um, and, and like they can interfere with, uh, with the learning of, of either. So I like, it's good to focus down those, um, like in one or the other. Uh, I am personally so much more interested in, in like, like the theory rather than technicals, uh, that I tend to find myself struggling with interface issues a lot, like not getting used to the interface or like, um, or like glitches or, or things like that. And, or, or like things being hidden inside of menus um, or like, like three or four menus or the clicks being too long to get to. Uh, I don't really like learning hotkeys too much or like working with hotkeys. I'll have a couple like obvious ones like the standards but uh for for more complicated so i i love having hud elements right at the like the tip of your brush right here and this feels like i, I know i talked to like talk down traditional art but like this this feels like i'm going up with my uh my pen and dipping into the oil well to to switch tools and i just love that and it's only like a centimeter away so in terms of speed, I yeah. Um, it's also like going with the the HUD elements instead of strictly hotkeys. Like it only hotkeys also means that you uh, you can drop the keyboard sometimes, and just have a like a, a seamless experience drawing straight to the this is the canvas uh, or as seamless as possible. That's what I tend to prioritize, just anything that's going to get rid of the barrier between me and the, the art. Um, there is terrible with some programs. really is. You know, like, your whole field gets, like, totally taken over. So, yeah. But there's too much going on. I kind of set mine up, like, after years of, of Halo, I kind of set mine up shockingly like the interface like, for uh, like, the, like the master chief hud yeah you got your shield up here that's the most important you've got the navigation down in the corner somewhere you're wet uh, video, video games good y'all the mission up here the mission title this, the quick save right here i like to this keep the getting really nerdy <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, this is so cute uh oh what happens Okay, all right, it's just a big file, and it's a PSD. That, that doesn't mean anything, y'all. Don't, don't pay attention to my Photoshop hate. So, okay. So you create, like, a base layer for everything. There might be some gradients coming in at this, at this stage. It's usually, if you see a gradient at this stage for me, it's, it's usually because, like, I've come back in after painting, uh, like, other layers and, and add thing, added things. Like I've tweaked the layers underneath to, um, like for stages that are later on in the painting process. Uh, start adding in the mystical elements, or rather, I okay. This is where the uh, the clips end right here. Is the anything like inside the character? That's that's where the clips. That's where the clips ends, and we start uh, we start working outside of the, the figure. Okay. Don't have this organized anymore. Class and shit. Uh, you know what? This is actually a really good time to go over to that. Um, So let's go over to our sketchbook. Canvas, circle. I don't really care about it being perfect. I'm just using my mouse now. We're gonna actually I am gonna I'm gonna use the uh, selection tool here. No, I'm not. I do. 
I'm just going to create a big soft space in here. So this is on a layer that's underneath the sketch or the line layer. And keep that one separate and sacred. Don't let anything happen to it until we want something to happen to it. You can lock it if you'd like. That would be here, the lock. That means uh, you can't actually. I forgot to lock it. You can't do anything if the program stops you from screwing yourself over. Someone's asking what brush are you using? Um, I'm using the standard, or well, not technically. I'm using um, the, let's see, a watercolor, uh, a version of the watercolor brush. Uh, I, I don't really use default brushes, and I don't really download brushes. I, I have very personal and highly specific, everyone does, uh, preferences for like a, the preference for a hard round, a type of hard round that incorporates, you know, um, a little bit of smearing, uh, a little bit of smudging, mm -hmm. and uses pressure sensitivity to kind of go through the two functions like that it uh it's got like a low setting where it's not adding any pigment to the canvas it's just uh it's just smudging and then if i press a little bit harder then it adds the the uh the the hue or whatever the pigment um but it does not smudge anymore uh, one point. <clears throat> How one interesting. On one yeah. point on that actually, I would like to point out is like you'll often see on a lot of uh, like artist patrons, they'll offer up their brush sets as, like as part of like uh, a thing you pay for, and people often get the impression. Uh, a lot of beginner artists have noticed that like they they really think that like the the trick to art is like all in the brushwork, and it's not. Like I would argue that to get good at art most professionals would recommend that you work with like the simple hard round and the soft edges, you know, don't get overly complicated because the brushes that they use are very like Petra said, very specific to what they do specific to what materials they're rendering. They know how to use those brushes. Those brushes won't make you a better artist and overlying on them will just make your art worse if you don't know what you're doing. Or they'll introduce what we were talking about earlier, a lot of interface frustration, like um, you'll start struggling with the settings of the brush, which you should anyway. You should know like how to how to use the brush engine before you start like picking picking up brushes just from anyone. Mm -hmm. um, that that absolutely should come first. You should know more about the tools that you're using before you start trying to use the tools, um, even if you're seeing good effect. Uh, it's helpful to know that stuff. It's really important to know that stuff because that makes you more modular. You can you can go you can pick up the program anywhere and start using it if you know what settings you need. Um, and the uh, Sage the Dragon is asking, how often do you use blending modes, and in what context would you use them in? Quite often, uh, I use blending modes most often for. Uh, for edge control, for like different kinds of edge control. Um, and let's actually talk a little bit about edge control. Um, so I have uh, a fill layer. I've left, I've left it a little soft on the outsides of the circle because we don't need to be perfectionists and everywhere and the world isn't a perfect place. So, you know, take that. Um, but also also because I like I like having a little bit of little bit of like a kind of like an ambient occlusion 
uh, around something. It, it wouldn't work like this in reality if this is a sphere and we're looking like the edges of the sphere wouldn't create like an ambient occlusion into space. But it would if it was like on a surface. Ambient occlusion, by the way, um, is a lighting effect where, say, you have a like a object getting close to an object takes on like a a really dark uh, shade, uh, showing that proximity to the object. Like put put your hands really close together and notice how the inside of your hands get really dark. That's ambient occlusion. Yeah. Um. It's going to, yeah, okay, so just to, to make sure I kind of blacked out there. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's when two objects interfere with incoming light coming from one another. It's kind of like, it's like this effect that you'll see. Um, it's like an extra bit of shadow, uh, or an emphasis on the shadow. So... Uh, but I like to use a little bit of the under, even though I, I totally didn't just now, but the, uh, like the under paintings, those quick things, like style thing anyway. It would uh, depend, but generally speaking, um, no matter what the lighting situation, when some, when your hand is making direct contact with something, there is no, there is no amount of like bounce of a uh, lighting effect that can get in between your hand and something. So if it's really close, it doesn't really matter the lighting situation where you're touching will get dark like you can notice that like if, if if ever you're watching video and someone ever gets really close to the camera you'll notice that their face darkens that's so, going to be an occlusion happening like yeah like a contact shadow okay uh I'm going to keep going. If someone asks directly about this, like, uh, just let me know. Sure, sure. If they're asking a question. Um, so uh, we have the base color here. We're going to lock that, uh, lock, the lock the transparency, uh, just for posterity's sake. Now, you could paint um, like all of the base colors that you need for an object, you could just paint them directly onto the base layer where like once the base color layer, once it's uh, alpha locked. Um, uh, that is a choice between allowing yourself the ability to easily come back in the future and edit that color um, or just being okay with that and 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 having like that degree of permanence involved so later on if i wanted to change this red i would have to do a selection to get that red and it might become like a challenge to get this like this gradient element um, it'd take a fair amount of excising so instead uh, if you if you need to be able to have that kind of uh, flexibility, uh, keep it there and just then you create the clipping mask that uh, that's stuck on top of there. Like yeah, and you go with clipping mask. Totally non-destructive is what we say. Uh, non-destructive being uh, a process by which like editing doesn't uh, uh, doesn't negatively impact, doesn't take over or destroy a part of the piece in the process of editing it. If that makes sense, yeah. Uh, so it still looks, it looks like more or less the same. Come in here, smudge and start. Like, like, yeah. like, would you say like overly merging is destructive? Uh, it, yeah, that's I me. Mean, there is definitely times where you need to merge like to get to the next phase or step or whatever. Uh, so yeah, yeah, but it, uh, you are you are making the choice to um, uh, take away that flexibility a little bit to sacrifice a little bit of the flexibility in order to like clean up your hierarchy. Um, you know, you can make as many layers as you want if you're powerful or, or make a, pretty much as many layers as your computer is powerful enough to, to handle. Um, 
more file or more layers and more folders are going to uh, more elements definitely especially if you're adding 3d elements into this or active ones uh, or guides uh, it's going to up the amount of power that you need um, but if you're working on like sub 50 like i made a like 2013 i made a, a 50 layer uh, painting, like cityscape painting, that um, was really chugging my computer in Photoshop. But uh, that was like, yeah, quite a while ago. Really old hardware. Uh, except that I think that was still like a uh, 8 gigabyte build. Or gigabyte. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so I'm going to. What am I going to. What are we going to do here? We're going to. We're gonna do that marble thing. Some might have seen me sketching this one before. I'm gonna add like another element in, like a cat's eye marble. And this is tricky because this is this is now this is like one of those marbles where the uh that that you've got this like cool string of color inside of it. That. Is that the Ayasara? Not anymore. <laughs> We're going to change it to my favorite color. Real. And this is what I mean by um, flexibility. I'm, I'm coming back uh, after moving on, and I'm able to edit uh, like the color or into elements like this. This, yeah, can be a lot easier. I'm already trying to start to like like paint over this too. So, but uh, the the way you do this is you like you. you there, the one of the tricky things about this is that you need to be good at like layer management. So uh, knowing how to navigate the layer, the 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 layer um, palettes, how to create groups or uh, folders, uh, but once you're used to that, it kind of it falls away. It's not so much. Of a problem. Very softly, kind of using that smudge part of it. I do have dedicated smudge tools. Okay. Have that. And now, like, I can lock this, come in with some red or something, get red again. Uh, and here I'm actually picking up one of the blend tools that I have, the dedicated blend tools. This is like every tool I'm using is pretty heavily modified, more or less, except for like the marquee tools. Those are pretty standard. And it's just it's just about knowing the interface and knowing uh, what my own preferences are. Style is so I get to unlock the alpha there to. Uh, paint or change the transparent pixels back over like ones that are actually active. And this is this is actually a form of edge control. So see here, I have like a really sharp line here, kind of hard edges and and all. Uh, but if I don't want a hard like a hard edge on the inside of this, because this kind of has like a cool effect, having a sharp edge on one side, gradient on the other, got a softness and a sharpness, sharp edge to the object, kind of clarifies where that that shape is. 
much to um, you can either like get that gradient or you can do what I'm using what I'm using it for here, which is to kind of almost act as an eraser a little bit, but uh, one that is respecting what's on the canvas right now. So like it's not going to pull like take away uh the transparency in that area unless I bring in alpha. Um but uh alpha's by the way alpha's just is like alpha is the the lack of of anything. It's pure emptiness, more so than the white. So stay away from alpha. Or no alpha's your friend. Excuse me. Alpha in Clip, one of the reasons I love Clip is uh, it's so easy to to use Alpha in smudging. But it is in Photoshop, too. Like, the, it's, it's got nice tools. It's got really nice tools that feel great. Cheap, it goes on sale all the time. I'm paid by them to pump them whenever I can. Is this a sponsored classroom? Oh, yeah. Well, oh, no, I mean, no. Wait. <laughs> okay. Here, like, here we have like a hard edge, and I'm gonna I'm actually gonna like soften this a little bit to kind of give you the the hint that this is like getting flushed with light a little bit. We're gonna keep the hard edge there. There's another question if you want to ask it, uh, answer. Sure uh, thing. On the topic of blending, might I ask your opinion on smudge blending versus color picked blending? Color picked blending. Yeah. Oh, do you find wait. your transitionary sort of colors. Do you do you blend and then color pick, or do you like independently pick, or? Ah. Uh... I want to have all of the essential pigments that I'm going to use. Like, I want to have them somewhere on the canvas at the full, like, full-blown version of themselves. Um, in part, because, like, when I do get to painting directly onto the can, like, uh, I, I, can have, I can have them on hand to, to source from. Is that... I think what they might also be talking about is like if I have two colors here and then like do I plan that out ahead and and kind of I'm kind of but like because my brush is set up to do both at the same time uh that's kind of like that's usually how I work is to have like both both there when I want to introduce a new hue I drop it in in some way uh like Let's go for like a highlight here. Um, I'll get that here. It, it can look ugly as sin and like really sharp. There can be like this uh, the um, the stamping going on. Stamping being when stamping is like like for anyone who just doesn't know, real quick. That's a stamp. That's a stamp. It's how brushes usually work. They have a just the there's just a rapid um, laying down of, uh, or at set intervals of, of, uh, of the shape of your brush. Uh, and the shape of this brush is a circle. It's just a solid circle um, with some property uh, characteristics, like you can change the hardness of it and a soft circle. This is nicely handled here in the tool property palette, which is also customizable. Um, but uh, like, even if you have these on here, it doesn't really matter because like, you come in here with the smudge tool, fade away, and what you're really looking for is, or what I'm looking for rather, is like the um, the long edge of uh, of the of the stroke or the or the pigment introduction. Or, could stamping be like a cool effect, like intentional or? Yeah, that's how most painters, most digital painters 
like in concept art, that's kind of like, that's the usual go-to is like a stamping method. Like, a, and that's what uh, people do when they build like these cool brushes that come with like, you know, like a building already inside of it. Like this is the stamp of the brush. Hi, building. So good. One of those Amsterdam buildings. We're going to put like a little hook up here. Oh no, this is too cute now. I'm invested, y'all. I'm getting in. Oh no. Just keep it. Just make it a part of the marble. <laughs> oh no. It's I might fun. have to. And they all lean too, you know, like all the buildings in Amsterdam lean, so they have to like they have to cuddle with one another and like that's, get reinforced on the side. This is get it. All right, we're done. That, we're that, moving on. Well, I was that, gonna say you you could actually like make that like the environment that this ball is sitting in, like outside of this house. You could in some way incorporate that. I'm not gonna do that because that would take time so for that. much time, and we don't have that kind of time. Okay. <laughs> but thank you <laughs> for the suggestion. Time is a mindset. Huh? Time. Time is a mindset. If Time is a mindset. When I get our damn houses. Time is a mindset when you're the only one who exists. So, sadly. Wow. Well, I don't know. Anyway, okay. You know, I, I, this is getting weird. Uh, so I'm gonna try it. We're gonna say that the light is coming from somewhere up here, uh, and that it's like it's maybe being projected by a lamp. So. You kind of see a little bit of that hard edge of the lamp edge reflected in the marble right there. So you're seeing the shape of the light fixture. Kind of like, yeah, keep that in mind. If it's like it's the sun, then you're going to get like, it's like a big ass blowout. But the perspective of the marble is going to mean that it's like stretched out. So I'm going to come up here. I'm going to grab my other smudge tool which is designed to pull, like, pull thing. Okay. Sun, the turn of marble. Go back to the, to the, I guess this is more like a blend. Really solid, really bright, something like that. Uh, the environment would have fit too. So, like, if this is actually this, get it like tons. Let's get rid of this. Uh, another thing I, I like about clip. Specifically, is the um, the fact you can use like uh, the current brush as an eraser by just selecting this uh, or the uh, empty text, the empty, the empty slot, no texture, totally transparent. You can kind of paint with it that way. Uh, but also, like the erasing in that situation would happen the same way that I'm making um, paint strokes. Uh, so you can you can get the same like textured effect if you're using a textured brush with the uh, with the process of erasing. And you can do that with the eraser tool too, but you got to set it up separately. Okay, so that's where it's coming from. Big ass arrow. What am I not in here? It's like a mushroom. Something like that. I'm gonna snag another layer, create a layer, and I'm gonna do so. So when light hits a surface, it doesn't just stop, it bounces. 
and it creates another form of lighting called bounce light. It named, but that's going to be light that's hitting the object from below in this case. I call this like a white, white tabletop. It's pure white though. Let's fix that. Let's fix that. Uh, actually, by selecting a color here, let's have, let's have a pink. Oh, I know, we'll have like an orange and we'll match the bottom of that. Kind of looks like this will be, maybe. Um, select a new color to fill the fill in the white area in, and come over here to edit and we'll hit change color of line to drawing. Uh, this is really useful, that little bit is really useful when dealing with uh, with line art that you need to unify if you've, if you've gotten multiple parts of your... Like if I've drawn half of this sphere, um, like a red, like the line art shit. If something like that's happened, uh, you can clean that up really fast. You don't have to lock it or anything. Good. Want to? By just like selecting that the uh, the color you want it to be and hitting change color of line to to drawing, which is gonna go down here to your uh, your selected color. Uh, so we have that. That going on. It's probably not going to be quite so. And the reflection's probably going to take. Soften the inside edge of that. Maybe to sort of suggest the end of the, the counter or something, wherever this is sitting, you have like a sharp line going through here. Sort of appearing and then disappearing as the uh, reflection gets close to the edge of the model. Or this is, uh, since this is glass, this could also be the end of the table from. So this edge, it's a sphere refracting. It's a transparent, so you'll see the edge there. And comfortable angle for these lines. What color is a mirror? What color is a mirror? A mirror, a, the mirror is whatever the color of the environment is around it. It's a, totally reflecting. <laughs> it becomes it becomes whatever color it is subsumed. It is the, it is the ultimate chameleon. I'm sure it's also based off like what actual material is is the the material comprised of. I'm sure it has maybe slight tints. Oh, well, if it's a mirror, strong. wouldn't it be clear? Oh yeah, between. if you take the if you take like the metal or the backing off of a mirror, it's just a piece of glass. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, a mirror doesn't actually exist. I It's a, it was a, it was a little bit of a meme question, but you know it's actually pretty interesting to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and 
this is looking pretty boring. So, but okay, everything we've just done here, pretty much is like how you build the rest of this. Um, you, uh, you can see that in the hair. I'm I'm just playing with edges uh, a bit. I'm just like softening one edge, keeping the other sharp playing with that contrast throughout. There's actually speaking about the head, let's talk let's talk about the hair. Um, so a lot of times uh, it's easy for us to think that even on a subconscious level, the way we fix a piece is by adding more bullshit. By like I can get her hair looking even better if I add even more directional line going over it like i'll get as much and they can be really freaking beautiful lines too like like pointed and arrowed and elegant flowy and shit but um eventually you run into like this this problem with clutter uh this visual noise uh you uh that you can actually see like elsewhere in my piece like right down here uh where i'm kind of using it uh, intentionally, uh, whether or not it's successful is entirely up to you. Um, but uh, it's it's in those situa situations, it's usually better to like take a step back and actually like start stripping away uh, parts. Uh, some Elon Musk or, or SpaceX or, or one of those companies, like one of their mod like. Someone in someone in that I think it was Elon said once said that like uh, the best part is no part. I think it's referring to Tesla and how they engineer their cars. Like the the best component is to not have one at all because that saves manufacturing time, uh, uh, materials, and, and labor, and uh, and then just because and complexity to the process. So if you can ever afford to strip away something. It's usually a good idea to do that uh, if it's redundant. So the reason that's relevant in the hair here is you see this lighting that I have on it. It's just like, it's just this. To go even louder. It's just this. Let's go red. Red. It's just this with, uh, with some softening going on. But... So there's a lot of information in this individual stroke, like the hair and the, the the tapering back here, the softness. Of, there's a lot of information I'm getting from a very small amount of data being given to you as the audience. Uh, and that can be really profound in a lot of ways, uh, particularly like in, 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 in dealing with narrative. Um, in addition to like showing and not telling, sometimes it's a better idea to leave out um, uh, certain certain things, like leave out explanations, or if anyone's seen Alien, leave out the fucking alien for most of the film. Uh, all the attack shots, it's just a like a really quick cutaway or like a like a like really dimly lit. You can barely see the alien. That actually has a greater effect on the overall impact. Uh, the overall emotional impact of, uh, of, of whoever's doing it. So it's, you don't need more. It's, well, the, the old expression is, uh, sometimes less is more. Uh, definitely true with drawing and painting. And always, always be like, always ask yourself what you can take away. And, uh, and maybe sometimes, like with down here, like, what can I add? And in what way can I add it? What like noise can I create in this area to to have other effects? Because um, visual complexity like this and absence of complexity uh, that's actually a compositional tool. Um, if uh, if we take composition to just mean like the means by which you are directing the attention of the viewer, uh, like where is the entry point of a piece and where is the the point of departure, or where's the hook? Where's the uh, the loudest part of the piece? Uh, it's all about like controlling a viewer's attention 
Uh, here it's, I'm trying really hard to get you to look inside of this bubble and then also inside of this bubble. Uh, but but this is where I want you to really, really look. So I have, like, you can do this sort of same trick a little bit with, like, faces, if you've ever heard of this. Like, the human face to an observer is really catching. They want to latch onto it to the point where we'll start seeing, like, mount, like human faces on the surface of Mars or, or creatures and constellations and things. We, we desperately want to anthropomor anthropomorphize absolutely everything as part of, like, a, a threat response. Um, uh, so faces are highly, highly attentive or, like, really, really grab your attention. Um, but that's kind of like, of course, I'm doing a character, so she's going to be here, like, whether, but, you know, have her head turned or something. But anyway, um, uh, but the same is true with complexity. So that's basically what it is. Like, the face is really complex structurally, but, the, but uh, so, like, we have just in terms of like painting, I guess uh, we have the um, little like like scrolling details. There's uh, like much more um, like there's more contrast between edges. Uh, the colors are more saturated. That's another color control. Saturation is is another effective means of controlling uh, the viewer viewer's attention. Um, and uh, I try to use. I try to bring that kind of complexity in a little bit and introduce it to like flow. Did have I gone over what flow means yet? Anyone? Flow? Uh, not so far. Not, not okay. to my knowledge. So like, uh, flow is kind of like the rhythm or the direction, like the 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 the, the flow from like a element to element inside of a piece. Uh, in figure drawing, it's it's like the that that it line is, of action. Yeah, uh, it, it is simply said movement. Yeah, it's movement uh, along something like a line of action, uh, which serves to direct attention or or uh, like direct. Actually, it doesn't does that function necessarily, or is that just a that's something I use it for, honestly. Like to direct attention. Um, but uh, yeah, flow is kind of like the the, the 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 jazzy movements of your style. The like the turn, the way your your lines turn, and I did kind of go over this, I guess, a little bit initially with the the line work. Um, but it can be shaped. You can have you can introduce new ways of of controlling flow with uh, the shapes inside of shapes, negative space as well, uh, the shapes of your lines. So it's a pretty like inorganic hard shape that has a point to it, a direction to it. It's got this line going like flowing through it up here. Uh, not everything in your composition has to follow the overall line of action in a literal sense you don't need like your all your fingers to be pointed upwards but uh this one does kind of like dictate where a lot of this other like uh, most of the dance goes around the the overall like beat i guess i feel like the a lot of the rhythm in your piece it, it follows the the orb then the trail on the orb into the hand so it has a very kind of swirling sort of like motion in in between all the parts of the piece yeah like a figure eight almost that's a great observation actually and i, I was trying to go for softness uh even in composition uh because the the theme is friendly and like warm and inviting and, and yeah all that jazz like a, a like nice theme instead of something like hero or heroic or jarring or frightening or scary or anything like that or moody um uh so i'm trying to be gentle with the movement of the uh viewer's attention i'm i'm trying to you know this gets pretty sharp here but 
we get a fatter line and a really bold light here um, to cushion, if you can think of it, like cushion the, the turn and, uh, and bring us softly around uh, in that direction change. Um, and then we also get like elements like this where you're kind of cradling the inside thing with the lighting effect but, um, and getting this boundary that, that keeps things inside. Um, the entry point, by the way, is like where the view is or where you want the viewer or where the viewer organically enters into your piece, where they begin. Um, to, to like to observe everything like here we have uh, if you go by the literal center of the canvas um, it's a little off uh, but her uh, her head is kind of the the exact like the, the, the center focus of the whole thing right um, so that becomes an easy entry point in addition to the details, in addition to the, 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 the lighting and uh, the flow that's going on around her head, going into her head, um, keeping you inside of it, maybe like jumping this into the bottom of her hair. And then you like, you can follow these lines as they swirl around and dip. Uh, and then once you've spent enough time up here, maybe you start going like through the ear, um, you notice then this like cutoff. So we've gone through it here. This might've been easy to miss, but like we go through the face and then we end up with like this point through just following like line work um, and, uh, and just our like organic attention. And then you have to you have to like confront that as 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 the viewer. You have to like uh, figure out what that is uh, without being told, hopefully. Um, and so it might like you might then notice like all of these little sparkles that are happening uh, all over, and how they collect in greater clumps at the edge of the sphere sometimes focusing so strong that like the edge just becomes a solid uh, point of illumination. Um, but then as they come closer to the face, as if this were a sphere, um, they start to space themselves out more. They find themselves spaced out more. Uh, so you get, there's, there's stuff going, stuff going on so much. So many ways you can, so many like tricks you can use to manipulate your viewer. Um, that's all we are ever, ever doing uh, in, 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 in art is just uh, like figuring out what is the best way to lie uh, at any given point for any given reason. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a science. Uh, Let's see. So um, some of these, some of these layers you'll note have this like crazy bleed out effect, um, or they're being used for lighting, and uh, it's because they're 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 special layers. They're uh, they've got like effects associated with them. This is like a glow is a is a fun way to like introduce a lot of blowout, a lot of illumination, a lot of glow. Uh, glow dodge. I think Ross draws used to, uses this one quite often. That's what I'm told, at least. I haven't seen for myself. Uh, uh, but uh, let's see. I don't know. Does this? Let's let's actually go move on to the Q and A at this point. I think. We've gotten pretty much through all of the essentials to to actually building um, like what this piece is. And I'm kind of, kind of wondering, like I'm I'm sure I've skipped over uh, two or three things uh, that are going to reveal themselves in the comment and like in a comments context. So yeah, what do we got? <laughs> what do we got? 
Any any questions at all? Why are you so good? Uh, years, years and years and years and years and years and years of. of let's see. I've been. I've been. Um, I started seriously drawing when I was like sixteen. When I made uh, like a, a comic for myself, a little like and just in like school paper stuff. And so you just picked up tips and tricks about coloring over those years from like a myriad of of uh, people, you know, or not, or did you learn from like a very direct source um, that maybe you could like, if people are curious, maybe look up on their own time. Oh sure, I've I've got plenty of things to recommend. Uh, uh, kind of like uh, depending on what exactly you uh, you're looking for. Uh, like uh, right now, I've. I'm trying to learn um, more about how Scott Roberts handles his red and his rendering. So one second, let me. Mm. Oh, I can't do video. Whatever. So Scott Robertson, Scott Robertson, yeah. Yeah, you you at you at Petra. Scott Robertson, uh, publi- with uh, with Thomas Bertling, uh, published two, at least two, and now there's probably more now. Definitely more. Um, excellent books. Uh, how to draw and how to render. Um, DM me if you need like the direct names and stuff. But the two of them go hand in hand together. The how to render one uh, is highly dependent on drawing, like on the on the drawing text, uh, as as is with everything. Like drawing is the the absolute foundation for represent representational painting so uh, I recommend that if for anyone who likes a, a more painterly approach or like a uh, like a watercolor effect James Gurney even though he uses traditional uh, mediums like wash and watercolor talking about the theme is still very sound for for working in digital. Um, you just have to figure out sometimes, like exactly how to get the, uh, exactly what tools to use to get that effect. Um, I'll go ahead and type those out real quick. Sorry. Let's see, yeah, sixteen. Uh, I kind of like. There's, I mean, there's obviously the books. There's. Um, I think I can uh, answer your... I'm not okay. checking names, but there you go. Sorry. Fuck. Yes. Oh, I'm using... I'm broadcasting the Discord. Sorry, y'all. But, uh... Okay, yeah. so... How long does it take to, to make this painting? Was it drawn at commission speed? Uh, uh, and then they also asked, how did you get so... How did you get a good one-person standing composition? A good one-person standing composition. What was the first one? Uh, how long did it take to do the the painting, the uh, not the demonstration, but the actual? I confess, I lost track of time. Uh, I it's I've been painting it for not counting the sketch from from like months that I pulled uh, from the sketchbook. Um, it took me about two days of like uh, intermediate intensity work but long hours to to get it done i spent at least i mean at least eight to ten on the whole thing for sure and, and uh commission speed that's sort of an interesting concept uh I, i'll kind of chime in there commission speed you shouldn't be thinking about it in terms of like whether or not you're ready to like obviously speed will come with time uh speed is a direct symptom of like skill and practice you know don't practice with speed in mind actually and, and costa said something that was like really excellent to this point Dr- you have to slow down and draw slower so that you can become faster you don't yes, go faster absolutely. to yeah. get faster you must slow down to understand your process so that you can you know once you're once you have a complete understanding you can do it 
faster. It just comes with time. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. can... Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, but with commissions, I generally go with the premise of like, you know, yeah, you should be working for an hourly sort of base raise, uh, a wage. Um, don't charge, don't undercharge. Please, please, please don't undercharge. If you're, if you're per performing to a high level, you can make quite a bit of money if you know how to work really quickly. But if you're, if you're starting out, don't charge too much because you're spending over time on on a piece know that your piece is going to have to compete within the market right but don't undersell other artists because in general we all have to we all sort of competing for a, a client base and if you undersell dramatically you're going to steal from other people uh without them knowing and in general, your art is worth more than usually what you give credit. I, like, I see Twitter artists fucking charging, like, $10, $15, and that just blows bl blows my mind. Like, it's fucking crazy. You, you're, they probably spend, like, a whole day on that, and would you, would you work for, like, $2 an hour? I don't think anyone would. Like, art is it's important. Certainly not. No, I charge, I charge, well... I charge too little, actually. I charge $15 an hour. Uh, so a piece like this would be quite expensive. Um, I've done pieces of a similar level of finish for around $200. Um, you're narrowing your, your commission pool, but, uh, and, and like you do need to do it efficiently, but like uh, going for like an epic effort uh, doesn't always mean like scaring away everyone in your in your pool. Uh, but, do you uh, think? Do, yeah. you, do you think the reason um, people undercharge is because a lot of people don't think art is like a legitimate career? Because I've noticed that a lot. A lot of artists are like, well, it's not like a real job, so they just undersell themselves. Yeah, I, de I definitely think there is that still that stigma that like artists aren't contributing anything when honestly a lot of the imagery and a lot of the media that people see is produced by large companies who hire large amount of artists who like people are so removed from the process of making the art itself that they've lost the value of what time and effort and skill went into putting that out there into the world and it takes years to train up to the level like be a professional you know it's not like something you can train to be in like a few weeks they forget that so you have two things i want to cover real quick one of them about line work the other about um potentially some like uh about a kind of a con contentious way of composing as well, another uh, means of composing, um, which is to use level of finish or like level of polish as a way of directing attention. So here you'll see that I have a left and right hand. You'll see that you might notice that uh, the left, the hand on the left is uh, quite a bit more detailed and finished than the one on the right. Uh, I've done this intentionally to show like the difference between the two, but if you zoom out, you probably didn't notice it. Um, it's this, this, uh, so it's really easy to misuse this and, and just, like for the sake of speed, say that you were just trying to use composition, you were using composition to, um, to, to not put in the effort of cleaning up your lines, which is kind of what I did when, with this. And I, like before I sought, I sought feedback for it, I was kind of like, oh, this is fine. No one's gonna really pay that much attention to it. And then someone, someone actually pushed me because this, this hand was too hard to read with the fingers stacked like this. Um, so, this one needed a little bit more definition than this one, even though this probably reads fine most of the time. Uh, but you can use this to direct people's attentions. Uh, you'll you'll notice that 
uh, the rest of this is about the same level of finish. Uh, but like in the areas that I want you to pay the most attention to, we get crisp, clean, or soft and smooth. Uh, everything's controlled and neat and clean and and uh, and nice and polished. Uh, whereas down here we get messy, we get uh, really loose. These are still sketch lines, um, but uh, they're kind of they're being used. Uh, they're also kind of adding, lending a little bit of of uh, texture in here uh, and direction as well. So or, or cluing you in a little bit to like the foreshortening that's happening in the arm as it uh, as it's coming towards you. So with uh, with the folds of these fabric, uh, these pieces of fabric. Uh, yeah, so you can use like the the amount that an area is finished in order to 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 uh, guide your viewer to where you want them to pay the most attention to. Um, Craig Mullins does this too. To throw out a big name, I think pretty. It's I've noticed it's kind of a contemporary thing. Uh, like the further back in time you go, the more like the whole canvas is like cared for. But you'll also see pretty splotchy strokes. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a lot. A lot changed for painting after after photography hit. Um, before photography, your goal as a as a painter was kind of to capture the 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 reality of a situation in as much vividry as possible. Even though there were abstraction techniques being used, like how they how they would sometimes stretch out horses uh, in hor in uh, paintings of horse races, where the the they're they've like they've like been put through one of those torture chamber stretch machines they're they're super elongated and all their hooves are reaching out really far ahead or behind them and they look completely cartoony but that that was the device at the time to show motion um because they first of all couldn't capture uh a horse until photography they couldn't capture a horse mid stride like and and study where everything was like it was just all it was just all observation um so uh but after photography the world started using photos to get the the the, the to, to get that sense of like reality and documentation and um and all that and painting had to face an existential crisis where we uh we had to all decide, like, what what is painting about if it's not documentation, um, and it it, be, it it since then uh, it's, uh, it's been a, a a wild ride of experimentation and theory. So, uh, kind of the origin of abstract art, you know, it's not about making a human look like a human. It's about like testing. What the color red does, as opposed to the color orange, when they're placed right next to each other, and you shove the viewer two feet away from the canvas, and the canvas is like uh, twenty feet across and, and ten feet high, or something. What, what does that do to a person? Um, yeah. So, instructions. I do want to talk more about them. I learned mm -hmm. a lot from studying Rothko. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, a really good lesson from Rothko is that like a big part of your painting of your of your process as a painter is it's fine. It's actually kind of good if it's just sitting in front of the canvas staring at it. Like that's a part of work. Um, that's not a break. Like contemplation, uh, taking a moment to really think about what you're doing. I think we were saying earlier. Yeah, like uh, instead of just. Uh, throwing as much stuff down as, as as you can at the same time or yeah. like uh, trying the same thing over and over and over again and getting getting nowhere with it instead just taking your time and i think the practice. best way to the best way to think about it is like time spent with the canvas yeah 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 let it drive you crazy 
a uh, question uh, from up above. So, someone's been asking this. Uh, the line on the demonstration piece, the rabbit. Um, there's there's a color line on the the ear that they really were confused about. Like, why is there a hard transition on the from the light? Like, why does that why does that light break off where it does and the the yellow on the the ear on the inside? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so I guess this is happening because we have the light the light source here coming across a concave shape so her ear is shaped kind of like like a a hollow and cut out uh, cylinder One thing I do really like about Photoshop is that is the really nifty like shift line tool. I miss that a lot. I miss that a whole bunch. Clip has one, but it like gives you a solid line. I really like that Photoshop's you can paint along a fixed line. Just a shift. That's I miss that a lot. If anyone knows how to change that in Clip, please get at me. But uh, okay, so. So the inside, let's let's be a bit more careful. Careful. So So the light is coming through here. It's missing this edge. And then it's being picked up by this edge. So the inside is being illuminated. Um, uh, and I put this hard edge here instead of like a soft transition because I'm going for a cast shadow from this edge. From, from this edge of the ear. So we're going back over here to this little abstraction. We get a uh, little more illumination here. But uh, yeah, and then the block creates that, that hard edge. And that's what we call a cast shadow when you have one object blocking another, uh, the light from another, creating that, that shadow. And I like that. Does that make sense? Guy in chat, person in chat, shit. I said that wasn't the line when uh, you circled the inner ear. This one. The vertical. Oh. Wait, this one. The, the vertical one, yeah. That one. Yeah. I, I can higher, draw that. Higher, higher up? So, this one. Oh, this one. This thing. That's me having fun. That, that doesn't make any fucking sense. I just <laughs> like the way that looks. <laughs> it's kind of like it's, a transitionary sort of like color thing happening. I don't know. Yeah, transition is is actually kind of what's fun, like it's doing functionally here. We're going from like a solid thing instead of using a gradient. I'm using a series of lines to uh like like hashing um, to slowly go over to like this color, like that that, uh, that value. This shouldn't be here. I don't know what that is. Uh, let's 
so and that kind of thing is fine like this is pretty nonsensical in here as i pointed out before uh, but like this shape doesn't isn't really very naturalistic is it these folds um Or like uh, this chunk here is super, like it's super sharp. It's a, it's it's, it's kind of its own crazy shape that's in here. That uh, and I just I just like the shape. So, so I was actually gonna, gonna ask about that. How do you like? How do you decide what you want to be soft and what you want to be hard? Because you've got a lot of nice like line variation in there, and I was wondering what are your tips for that. I could, um, give, I could give one answer. Uh, all right, sure. What do you got? What do you got for me? So when it comes to a strong, it, it depends largely on how close your object is to the light source, how bright the light source is, and how, because that will directly affect the, 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 the hardness of the light. Things that are really close tend to have really stark shadows. Uh, things that are far, the light being farther away from the subject will produce a softer effect because the light has had more room to properly diffuse. And so, um, we call that effect tapering. Yeah. Um, fall off. so that, that will, that will play one part of it. Um, another part is, uh, the planes that you're dealing with of, because if you're thinking about your subject in a 3D way, which you should, 2D drawing bad, don't do that. <laughs> you have to be thinking about you have to be thinking about your your object in 3D uh, space, and you have to be thinking about the planes and how they shift, and based on if the uh, the angle change of your plane is a hard one, that is going to create a hard transition versus if your plane like a like the cheek for example for an example if your cheek is soft you're going to if it has a round if it has a curve to it then it's going to produce a soft transition you know more of a gradient sort of uh subtle shift in in uh in plane change whereas a direct angle of like a very angular face will produce very hard shadows very abrupt value changes that's one answer uh are you asking specifically for lighting or are you asking like uh shape like uh, edge control and like shape determination like are you asking about that in general um a little bit of both um but i was more talking specifically about like your line quality as opposed to the shadows Ah, like, gotcha. Your line art, um, more of the consistency of that is to like balance a painting. Um, although the other stuff is, I'd like to know about more about that anyway. <laughs> also, the answer was good. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, so how do I decide when I want? So, uh, when I when I have like a a hard edge, uh, like an outline, uh, or when I'm when I'm trying to define the boundaries of an object, I tend to lean on on line, like really bold, heavy lines. Uh, when I'm dealing with things that are inside of those objects, like edges, such as such as this one, uh, that's when when I don't want to introduce too much visual chaos. I guess is a is a simple answer. I I'll try to like soften things up a bit. That's the wrong. One. So, yeah. Uh, and then I'll cut. Uh, a harder edge along like a, a soft thing. This isn't really showing it that well. Let's go back to the let's go back to the sketches. Let's see, you can see it for the for the lighting. 
but it's kind of like what the what the effect is too as well because like I, I broke that here um to give it a softer edge kind of like to play off the light or the uh the way that this is wrapping around and so this is like this edge is further away from us than this one so adding that in is to sort of take you take you through i guess How do I choose? It's... Has that helped at all? Like, I feel like this is getting a little yeah. difficult to answer. Okay. No, 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 no. It, it helps. Yeah. Like, I, I, I get what you mean. You don't want to add too much, like, too much detail to certain areas of paintings as to not overcrowd it. Yeah. Yeah. And to keep the read, um, clean and concise and easy to follow the read being like um you know the the uh, any i guess it's it, you have your first read that's like the first time you've seen it it's like the at a glance read uh, how are things working at a glance and then the second third fourth these are all like what you get each time you come back for whatever for whatever number read it is so you want a nice, clean first read, so you don't have to like repeat. You don't have to bring the um, the viewer back in order for them to get the full extent of what you're trying to tell them, what you're trying to like give to them. So if you're trying to tell a story, you and then like it's moving quickly, you want them to be able to pick up that story really quick, uh, pick up all the details nice and fast, uh, and giving them too much information because there's only a finite amount of attention they can offer. Um, and it's going to depend on what your audience is. Uh, like, you have a finite amount of time and a, a certain amount of uh, data that you can offer to them. And after that point, uh, you start to lose their focus or lose their understanding. Always want to be nice and efficient. So unless you're, in, unless, of course, like, because there are no rules, unless your intent is to throw them off uh, make them wonder more, um, uh, confuse them, etc. That is a tool that you can use. So, thanks for the answer. Hey, sure. Thank you for the question. Uh, I also have a question. Please. Um. So. Uh, I kind of have an understanding of how like the the use of the hard and the soft brushes works, but um, when it comes to the actual process of doing them, like how do, do, do you work with like, do you work with or without pressure, opacity, and also like with tapering? Because I think I misunderstood in the beginning. Uh, so I'm just trying to understand like are you plain like round brushes with no pressure or pressure or pressure or uh how am i trying to say it like pressure like with, um, with the pressure opacity and like the, the tapering yeah like do you work with those things off and just kind of cut stuff out with either a soft or hard brush afterwards or uh i switch between like all of these settings uh i will play with inside of the brush that I'm using. So this watercolor one, I have a like the quick menu here for tool properties. It has all of these like these like uh, variations ready on hand. So instead of switching to a totally new brush, I'll just play with this a little bit and uh, change the properties enough to get the uh, the desired effect. So you kind of just work with the things as you go. Yeah. Uh, uh, I see. It's not, and I'm not like starting over every time I go over into the tool property. Usually all I want to do is just like, I have a hard round right now and I just want to have like, I just want to have a soft round. That's all I want. Uh, but I want to maintain everything else about the brush. Like I want to have the same pressure sensitivity, the same tilt properties, the same uh, the uh, texture associated, um, the same density and flow. 
uh, the same smudging effect. So, like, it just... Boom. So, yeah. So, ease of access. When it does get to the point where I want a totally different tool, then I make another tool. Uh, I love this form of mark making so much that I honestly, I don't have, like, a sketch. I, I've tried... Like I've tried making specifically sketch brushes before, and this isn't really applicable to, to Procreate. Procreate behaves so differently that like uh, I, I do actually, I, I use the chalk brushes in there most often, but uh, Procreate's a special animal. There's these, there's these sketch brushes in here. I, I just don't use them as much because like, uh, I like getting really, really good at one tool. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, the marker, actually, I should say, like the marker here, uh, I use a lot for the fill layers. So when I'm not trying to get like a great, a weird gradient over it, or I actually care about um, like sticking to the outline, I will like I'll use the marker to, to just like to act as that fill layer. If I'm not using the selection tool, selection tool. Sometimes you need to correct um, correct something really, really tight into the line work, or you, like me, you're using opacity for your line instead of like a uh, like thickness. Wait a second here. There we go. Okay. Uh, but that can mean like, see here, I'm getting a little bit of a, getting a little bit of that blue showing underneath it. And it's nice to have like a manual brush for filling in things or for establishing that base color, mm -hmm. base fill layer. So it just looks natural. Here's an interesting question from uh, a little bit of a while ago, but the Ashkenaz, uh, if I'm saying that correctly, um, asked, how do you pick your color palette, especially in situations with odd lighting? With odd lighting? Yeah. So that is going into color theory, which I am not prepared to teach here a little bit, but <laughs> I will go, I'll try to go a little bit into. Um, so when you're imagining your scene, depending on the, the tone or the theme, you might want like something like a, a warmer scene or a cooler scene. So if it's, if it's exciting, if it's sensual, if it's uh, yeah, any of that jazz, you might want to go for a warm palette. If it's moody, somber, uh, cold, like literally in a cold location, you want blue. Um, and if you stick to only two or three colors predominantly for the whole thing, two or three hues, um, then you'll you'll generally get like let's say let's say I did better go back for the bunny. There we go. So it's a, this one is really flamboyant. The colors are extremely strong, um, like saturated, I should say. Uh, so they've got a lot of, got a lot of pigment there here in the color wheel. Um, but uh, for the outside of the suit, again, you'll see that like a, this is like a lower saturation. It's darker outside the bubble. Um, so, uh, so, but uh, since the overall theme is is to be like uh, friendly and warm, you have like a warm tone to everything. You have the gold. Um, it just like uh, once you have the mood that you want, uh, and you have maybe uh, the one color that you're especially that you especially want to use, then it follows depending on what your complementary color patterns are going to be. 
um, to just like just like so if I wanted a piece that's blue uh, and uh, predominantly blue, you might pick like greens and like darker blues or purples just to stay within that area. Purple gets a little warm; it starts going into the other side of the like the warmer uh, half of the of the color wheel. Uh, but like in this range, it's going to be pretty concise. If, uh, if you're going for contrasting colors, you just go to the other side of the wheel and you get like uh, contrasting like that. That's a valid way too. Like uh, if you follow the the eighty like the eighty twenty or the the seventy twenty ten rule, where you have like seventy percent of your canvas is one color. Uh, twenty percent is the next color, and the last ten percent is the, the smallest color. So that kind of like a what is it? The golden ratio type deal. I don't know what the actual ratio that. Um, you can kind of you can kind of uh, gain your palette by by that sort of thinking process. Um, Complicated because it's not true all the time and color theory. I'll have something prepared on color theory later. Uh, it's it's a gigantic topic. Like uh, talking about grays. I love talking about grays. Um, and there's that. I, I think it might have been. I don't, I don't know. I don't think it was Ethan that had a a, a piece on grays and cynics, but. Uh, but like, yeah. if you if you want like a like videos on like color theory if any of y'all y'all are just curious like marco uh Bushi, uh and oh yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah yeah like he he has a great a video kind of series displaying how light diffuses and and kind of takes on the color that it bounces off of and it it transmits like because light all light is is just a it's rays hitting and projecting off of every single surface, and take it takes it transfers off of each other, and it becomes something that our eyes distinguish. It's it's why it's a it's a really important subject though, but it's 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 massive in scale. But I would highly recommend you uh, any of you guys to watch those videos if you're curious and understanding how light is a factor in yeah. in how we see things. It's essential at a certain point. This one, I hold on, checking. Yeah, and uh, if you look in the theory, uh, if, if look in the side, uh, there's also, you know, Blender Guru. Uh, that's a 23 minute long video, but I would say it's like the greatest 23 minutes that you'll ever get out of a out of a video covering color. Um, you know, but yeah, like Mark Burnett, Marco Bucci, uh, you know, uh, Dave Greco is another one. He's a great artist uh, that does a lot of rendered illustration. And he, he covers all those things, all the stages of a drawing, including color. So I would definitely recommend them. I'm just going to have some fun here, maybe. If people want to follow up. Uh, are you guys still taking questions? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I wanted to ask, um, because I recently got Clip Studio and I'm trying to switch to it. How do what what did you go through, uh, when you were like, how did you figure out what to modify the brushes or like how did you learn to switch them to your personal preference? It takes a long time to to learn that stuff organically, uh, or it did for me at least. And I was learning while the programs were kind of making their biggest shifts. Uh, earlier on, uh, so some tools or some parts of the tools have been added uh, since when I first started learning them. So it's 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 kind of like a continuous process. Um, but it's really it's about like having a rough idea of knowing what you want to get, uh, and then like 
most of the time what follows next is is almost like a google away so you just you just search for for Go like what google. you want yeah, yeah google is your friend it's wonderful uh or you go to like communities such as this one it, like yeah uh eventually though like the it, it feels so cumbersome at first and i i know it's a i know it's miserable uh but if you can just like if you can get the two or three brushes that you like and then learn why you like them which is really important um that's a great starting point. uh learning how to break them like how to how to destroy the effects that they're providing and then put them back together that's another great way of learning uh we're just watching tutorials like on the on all the various settings that kind of answered that tangential i felt like we went tangential honestly clips to do paint see once you figure out where the settings actually are it's pretty easy to kind of figure it out mm -hmm. it's kind of not like like paint tool sigh where everything's just on one side and that's that it's like hidden away slightly but when you get it it's kind of straightforward i think yeah you get there if the tool property is up it's 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 this handy little button here uh and for the window it's the uh sub tool details tab under window um, a good thing sorry yeah. no go ahead I, a good thing about clip is you can actually like hide in um, different or or make different features like in other words visible so it's easier for you to change so you don't actually have to go deep into the settings each time you want to like change the opacity of a brush you can like like essentially you can pick and choose what properties you want visible for that pen so it can actually be really easy to like customize and tweak brushes on the go yeah fair mm -hmm. point all right i mean i i don't know how much you help but i, I still appreciate it <laughs> just just you know google and, and you know and is honestly like you know uh learning the ins and outs the shortcuts you know just going into the options and seeing what keys do what you know there's also the factor that many of the things you would learn in that like during that process are things you can then apply to any other stuff that you will ever pick up and that is the things that will be really valuable to you in the long run because once you know what i don't know a taper is once you know your, your brush density or your hardness, those are things that you will always need when you pick up a new software. And that's how you stay in the industry because oftentimes you don't know what things will be, you know, yeah. industry standard. Like, like right now, Photoshop is standard, but that might not always be the case. So really, y'all, don't paint the highlight. So, Good answers. Thank y'all for chiming in. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be the case as long as Adobe has their say. They'll keep their iron grasp on the market or the industries. It really There's... shouldn't, because Photoshop wasn't even originally meant for painting. It was for photography. So I don't understand why artists use it in the first place. It's like, it wasn't it's made by artists. Work, well, that's, that's actually... Both of those reasons are why, like, there's kind of a separation between program use. Like, uh, someone like me who's not really working in a production pipeline is a freelance illustrator or whatever. Um, I don't really need uh, the the some of the functionality of Photoshop, the uh, plug and play aspects of it. Uh, I just need a really nice feeling personal tool um, that uh, ticks all the boxes and uh it doesn't cost too much and for anyone else in my situation that kind of eliminates photoshop um usually or there's that's 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 why at least uh clip studio and why paint tool side have have gained such a such a foothold and alternatives to um in Krita as well Krita, Krita. um i actually got another question sure please awesome um so when you're working like what is it Sometimes when I'm working on something, I like to just get a little messy and have fun with it. Does do you think that helps with your progress art wise, or do you think it's just good to have fun? Hell yeah. Um, 
I mean, like, is it purely is it purely fun, or do you think you get something out of it more than just it being entertaining? Um, so I get a lot out of researching the sort of philosophy behind uh, a lot of a lot of this stuff, which I can't I don't want to dive too deeply into because it does sort of involve politics and like our roles as as illustrators and uh, influencers and whatnot. Um, but, uh, I, I really like thinking of, uh, of my role in art as being something of like a researcher or a scientist, like figuring out ways to, uh, to play on perceptions and tell stories and find the mechanics behind all that. That's kind mm-hmm. of what I think of this guy, which might be, I feel like that's probably the real answer as to why I appear to know as much as I do. Um, uh, at least technically. It's because there's a, there's a lot of weird stuff going on that isn't always a part of the, the standard formula that you usually find them in. Uh, if that makes sense. Uh, kind of. I think I get the, I think I get the idea. Okay. I think there's a lot of enjoyable aspects to to art outside of just doing the piece itself. You know, uh, it, it it is a learning opportunity every single time you put your, your pen to page. Because oftentimes, unless you're doing literally the exact same subject the exact same way every single time, you have to work your brain. You have to, it is, art is a very, you know, mentally exhausting uh, like activity like yes. uh, there are days that like after after eight hours of working on a piece i'm just wiped i i gotta lay down i you know like because it's just so intensive like n- while it's not physically like I, i've sat the entire time uh, well i don't think you should do that i think you should get up and get breaks and go to the bathroom you know you know, uh do like take care of yourself but after after all that it's just it wipes you but it's so you learn something every every single time you and you get up and you feel like a more accomplished person after doing that one piece like you should you like if you if you're not learning something every single time that you you draw there's something wrong i find you know that's just my opinion um I do get a lot of enjoyment out of trying to enter uh, what's called flow state, uh, which is where it's it's a it's a mindset where um, all of the interface, everything between you and the and the artwork, just sort of falls away, and you just kind of feel like you're dancing with your pen, and like uh, all the marks you're making are hitting exactly where they need to go they're flowing exactly the right way and it's it it all feels effortless and uh yeah it that it's very rare for me to to get into that uh state completely i did get into it uh, a fair bit with bunny gal here so uh, uh very happy for it when it does hit uh, apparently stuff like meditation can help but uh kind of a mystery to me but uh yeah there's definitely i mean yeah yeah you have to be having you have to be having fun uh, i mean even if it's even if it's work i guess well you should begin to learn like uh, you to succeed as like someone who who is wanting to do this like professionally you have to find the learning process or else yeah. Yeah. Uh, or else it's just going to be a slog, and you're going to you're going to burn out first of all, and you're like you might get somewhere right if you like churn super hard, but you if, if you have no inherent passion in, in in it, by the time you reach that finish line, you're going to be just about ready to collapse, and you don't want to go any further. When you when there's no real finish line in art, not until the day you die, like you you might you might say like getting into the industry but that's just getting in you've now just actually started 
in in a way like it's it's just another race which leads to another race to another race and another, another. <laughs> it never ends so if you're in this for the long run you're going to you have to learn how to enjoy the the journey enjoy the process keep moving never look back and just I'm still learning most of this, by the way, y'all. Like, I know that yeah. it's, sometimes this doesn't come easy. Like, and it doesn't define you as an artist either, like uh, having to go through struggle. But, but yeah, you definitely need another, you need a solid reason for wanting to do what you do. Like, yeah. Yeah. That, that's what, deci- I, I, but I feel like that decides between someone who's a hobbyist, who does it in their spare time, you know, but versus someone who's going to make it in the industry like long term where's the yeah okay so actually on that i have another question sure um so for me personally i know i i like you were talking about it's like truth be told when it comes to the learning process i know that in order to improve in order to improve uh you gotta you know you have to do studies and they're not always fun um I want to ask like my personal reason for trying to get into art because I do want to get into the industry eventually or not even the industry just want to be able to survive off of it is just Mm. the goal of making things that I like to see you know I don't know if that's something I could survive off of like spirit wise or if I would emotionally die eventually no um I'm actually in a similar boat with you um and and Petra can jump in here too uh at any time you know cut me off here but like, I, I, I think most artists, any artist who's going to do this for a long time, ultimately, just wants to do what they already like seeing, or they don't. They feel like there's a lack of it in the world. Like, my, my art is is made custom tailored to my tastes, and of course, I'm kind of putting out that that view for someone else to see um and interpret unless you <clears throat> unless you anything you draw you tuck into your uh you know your dresser drawer you hide it and you never show it to anyone but um you know if if other people are going to see it it's a message your art is communicating to someone else maybe they don't leave a comment maybe they don't like see exactly what you see but you're attempting to make a connection that is visual and it's just a perspective it's just through your lens it's not true reality but people find will find beauty in that uh, you'll you'll be able to make a living off of definitely freelance like there's a large market for freelance um and that's what i've been doing for the past two years petra for longer probably but um Oh, you know, oh, yeah. I've, I've I've been trying to make it work for years. Um, I'm I'm pretty poor uh, for the business side of it, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and staying super consistent with posting and all that jazz. So, um, yeah, I I I just I have so much more interest in the actual craft, like in the in the process than than like. Uh, the the management side but uh you also yeah. asked about like are you going to spiritually die in the industry it depends i want to say so uh, because there are some positions some ips some companies that will put you in a position which they know is grunt work which is the work that no one's going to really see or appreciate that like you um it's it's going to be a part of a large backdrop but it's never the center focus that's why everyone wants to be a character designer me included because that's what people look for uh, that's what a lot of people look for but there is a lot of jobs in the industry that are like background design uh prop design uh you know things like that that get kind of overlooked but are, are just as important but that's for some people is is not not what they want to do. 
do. So we put that brush there, their dreams, because you wanted to, to draw people, but now they're having you, like with Ethan's case, they had him painting rocks. Like, just strictly rocks. And oh, these are interesting, but yes, it's it's yeah. If it's a grind, it's a grind. It doesn't matter what it is, but like rocks are really fun to make. Um, as an aside. So, anyway. yeah, yes, I I think that there are. You have to apply to uh, specific IPs to the sp specific companies that you think you will fit naturally in what you would wouldn't mind being a part of a larger thing that maybe not everything you do gets limelight but that, that you i mean first of all this is a job and, and you're getting paid so there's that motivation for it but then you know artistically spiritually you know that you're contributing to a a, a large uh a large thing that will ultimately reach people's screens people's uh you know uh whatever if you're working in video games or comics you your work will be appreciated and you'll be able to say hey i worked with this company and that will you know it's just it you have to you have to apply smart don't don't just apply everywhere because i know for me i wouldn't want to be caught dead applying for ea because everything they do is super photorealistic photo bashy all that stuff that's not me that's not my style and i so i wouldn't work in ea so i'd never apply yeah something like insomnia games if you're if you have more cartoony that stuff insomnia games is, is really, really great one of the big ones uh there's also epic games yeah you can make fun of fortnite all you want but like you know they're they're a good company and they produce they, that, that, that'll give you a job um, that will accept sort of more cartoonier aesthetic. And then if you're into anime, you know, uh, there's less options, but there's still indie games. And like, if you wouldn't mind moving to Japan, there's tons of opportunities over there. I'd also like to add something on that note, if you have a sure. minute. Sure. Because um, I found that really interesting because you reminded me of something else that's also quite important. And that I feel like sometimes in the art community, especially online, uh, kind of gets a bad rep just out of like, I guess, I don't know, force of habit. <laughs> but something that's really, really important is to, if you are able to physically, mentally, network, go to that barbecue, make that friend, approach yeah. that person, Join go. That yes, yeah. yes, Sarah as well, but like, I'm also really, I really want to stress the value of meeting people face to face because I think everybody knows that in this industry there is um, a notorious practice of preferring people that they know because mm -hmm. you cannot gauge social social skills by portfolio. It's very hard. So many people will when they are hiring and they have one spot and they know one person and three people are qualified, they will get the one person that they know and. Um, that's not something you can really blame them for because again it is sometimes really uh tough to know what you're getting into with artists i think we all know that <laughs> mm -hmm. um so i really want to stress if you have the opportunity to uh maybe meet someone who knows some people and they they have a company barbecue and that company barbecue also hosts other companies in the same city maybe it's metropolitan um go try it may be boring maybe you won't get much out of it but there's a chance and you you really trust me you really want to take it like it's insane uh, yeah like really honestly just get good at introducing yourself like you know hey my name is blah 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 you know, yes. I, I i i just really liked what you you don't you, you you guys do i i love the stuff i was wondering if you could take a look at my stuff and maybe cons uh, consider me uh for like, if you could check this out, I would I'd love to hear your uh, opinions on this. Like, because I... Yeah. Been, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and if you're, if you're... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I just want to add, like, don't be afraid to be honest that you really, really like a place. Because the worst thing that can happen is they meet you again in a year after telling you, no, you were too whatever. 
they'll be like it was so sweet and heartwarming how much you liked us like they will not be like oh my god look at this nerd he really likes us like that's just not <laughs> a thing but i think especially if you're still in school taking uh public speaking taking classes like if you know you can't really do it on your own if you don't even know where to start for learning like how to speak and how to like it's it's an important skill to learn don't well, be afraid to take classes on it. Or not ask about that. I wanted to add to that because where I am right now, um, uh, fun little facts about myself. I made a dumb decision, and instead of pursuing art for uh, my current education, I went into science, which I'm discovering I don't like. Uh, mm. But also a part of that is I have to take a lot of public speaking stuff. Um, mm. And I, I had a whole class dedicated to coming up with uh what is it it's projects uh project solutions product project management um so a lot of it is learning how to come up with a solution research provide sources and then present those sources and so um i was going to ask off of that if having uh because i personally already have some pretty good socializing skills and i'm pretty good at selling something is that going to help me if i were to get into the industry yes <laughs> so that's that's anything. Yeah, yeah. Just always. You know, unless you're unless you live on an island and you're so totally self sufficient and whatnot, it helps you to learn how to talk to people. Also, it's very important to research. Like it depends on your position, of course. It depends on your company, whatever you want to do. But in most of those settings, people will appreciate you if you are the person who will help them reach a specific You will be that person if you know what to look for. And knowing what to look for is what it seems that you actually are studying right now for your project. And that is so valuable because many artists just don't really have that. Well, my stuff is, since it's science-based, a lot of my stuff is like researching studies and citing proper sources and learning how to find a source that works for something. I don't know if that would apply too much to the art industry. Uh, yeah, I mean, think about like when you're organizing your ideas and having like even in like science field, you still have to be able to organize your ideas and then convey those ideas succinctly. To yes. People. And you need to be able to te you need to be able to construct hypotheses and like be able to test them and arrive at a conclusion as to whether or not it's been effective. And you need to be able to be impartial to that uh, like process as well. You need to be able to um, embrace failure. Uh, there's so much like science in art that I feel kind of gets underplayed or maybe undervalued. But yeah, scientific artists. It's, I can't see a, how that wouldn't be like really beneficial. Yeah, you don't even have to use the hard skills of science. Like You don't got to meet up with somebody and be like, I can calculate something real quick if you want. You could always just be like using the soft skills of your education, essentially. Okay, this this brings me some peace of heart. Thank you. Bless you. I actually had another question, and it was to do with it. Just to anybody who really wants to answer, but um, how do you loop? of like fixing and fixing a piece of art because recently I've been finding myself just getting stuck and never finishing a piece and just oh, start a new one start a yeah, new one the, immediately yeah, exactly that's that was exactly what I was about to say you got to know your cutoff point you got to like for me I think about it in stages right I, I will often submit pieces of artwork to discords for like feedback and whatnot and I'll incorporate that all throughout my process. But ultimately, once I get to like, if I ever, most pieces don't actually reach like a uh, a final sort of color phase before I scrap them, like because I'm not liking the idea. I, the, you know, it's, it's, a, a, it's a lot about testing how much you can sit with something that you hate. Um, but generally speaking, if you get, something done and there's like done in the sense of like you have colors you have transitions you have all that but it would if if changing it would require a significant redraw then it's just better to just not just move on just just don't even fix what you've done 
move on. If it's not something you have to turn in or submit or, uh, you know, to a client or to an employer or anything like that, if it's your own work, s just drop it. Yeah. What's the cost benefit analysis of continuing a piece that's stressing you out? No one's paying you for it. It's not even something you're going to throw into your portfolio if it's if there's that many things you feel need to be tweaked. So weigh that and then decide from there whether it will be beneficial to continue this piece. A friend of mine has a uh, non-industry standard term that he likes to use for a fix that ultimately does not affect how the piece will be seen. He calls it ice cream snuggles. Um, if you find that doing a particular fix does not affect how uh, does not affect how the piece is seen, then don't worry about it. Mm, okay. Uh, uh, also, I was just like sitting there kind of smiling to myself because I've never thought about just trashing the piece of art. You're like, Absolutely. I've never thought about it. I'm not getting paid for it. Why am I stressing Bro, I throw so, so many pieces out. <laughs> so many. I think this also, oh, sorry, Petra, please go first. Okay, all right, yeah. So, like, I have, I kind of have, like, a rule of thumb for whenever I decide I want to maybe trash something. Uh, and that is to, like, like well, for one thing, I, like, remember, I keep a sketchbook of, of everything I do in the month. I have to be really, I have to actually intend to try to, like, to never want to see it again uh, if I decide to delete it. Otherwise, it's fine. I just hide the layer and move on to the next layer. But I still keep it, and I feel like keeping it is sometimes really important. No, it's 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 really important in traditional media to keep a sketchbook. It's you you should keep a sketchbook like all the time. I I'm like a exclusively a digital artist. I kind of I quit traditional art like uh, <gasps> like a long time ago. Yeah, so right. Sinful. I know, right? I know, I know, I know. I'm the the day walker, or whatever. Um, I'm the same. Don't worry. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> uh. Yeah, there is a bit of a philosophy behind that too. Well, like yeah, I, I already mentioned that I don't really consider digital art to be analogous or adequately analogous to traditional art, and so if you treat your digital art the same way as you would traditionally behaviorally then you can make up for quite a lot of the deficiencies that are often cited as being like a a, a detriment in uh contrast to traditional art it's meaning like whenever someone says that like 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 digital art and is isn't as good as traditional art um for a, you know x y and z reasons or that you have to have a physical sketchbook because you have to be going through a ton of iterations uh, and have that like physicality and stuff. You can you can have like anyone who says that uh, they miss the uh, the interface uh, or the uh, the way you have to like physically switch tools um, or there's a romance to like having like a physical movement and and like maybe flipping over to an eraser or um, uh, or switching to a knife uh, brush or a, like anything that that's like that's uh, there's ways of working around each of these things. Um, fuck, I got on such a tangent there. Sketchbooks, though, like, it's, for one thing, it's nice to be able to go back in time and see where you came from. That's always, like, a wonderful feeling after a while, like, you, when you can see the difference. And if you're just starting out, you're going to see the most difference in the shortest amount of time. This is when you're going to, like, this is the level 1 to 50 zone, or 1 to 20 zone. Um, really quick leveling uh so it's it's really encouraging uh with all the battles that you're having to fight with all of the experimentation and all the dropped pieces that you're not going to be able to finish for whatever reason or work utter failures it's really nice to be able to look back at at those non-successes and compare them to where you are today and that is like that's after all that's the only metric that you really should be measuring yourself by you should not be going by like comparisons to other artists it should be about your own progress uh, at all times so you have that archivability one thing if you don't throw your piece away um you also in the future you have a known failure point like you have 
a like when when you are when you failed a piece, you have a proof, you have a reference for what doesn't work. And that is more important than having a piece where for you to reference where everything has gone correctly. Right? We, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Does that, does that make sense? It, it, we learn more from our failures than we do from our successes. Yeah. So if you're, let's say you're like, like a, you're doing a full page of sketches, like, a, like figure sketches. Um, and you run into like a real doozy. It's an earlier marble. Um, like you start your day all the way down here and you're you're doing like a two minute sketch and all that comes out is like three boxes and a couple of sticks. But like you're warming up. You see that like some of the decisions, once you've moved on to this piece here, this this figure, you can look back on your canvas and see, well, hey, like this was taking too much time or this angle wasn't right. I need to pay more attention to that. You can do all of that checking sort of while you're working on the next thing. Um, so it's it's sometimes worthwhile to keep some of the the bad ones. Okay, and and why ran? So I like to keep them. I keep I keep a lot of them on hand, even though they're digital. Even though they're just a digital delete away, um, I like to keep them all on hand and uh, like have that window, have that reference. Uh, mm -hmm. I have another question. Okay. That that was a good answer. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> that was helpful. Okay. So, uh, what if you are doing digital, but you also want to keep two traditional stuff as well? Oh, bro, I stuff? got I got that for you. Hell yeah! <laughs> you can do anything. Okay. Yeah. So, do talking it. about keeping traditional with your digital, I honestly find that sometimes it's better to have separate styles for those two things. Like, I have a style that I use digitally, and I improve upon that as I use digital programs, like, as I find, figure out different ways to utilize these programs. However, traditionally, I find that they kind of, there's a separation, I think, of the skills that can be effectively applied both ways, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would say, at least for me, what has worked out best for me is having separate styles for those two medium. All right. So, like, if I were to do something digitally, like, let's say I do stuff digitally more cartoony versus when I do stuff traditionally, it's a bit... Uh, That's realistic. exactly that. Like, okay. my traditional work is always rooted in realism. And, I, of course, I, I can do cartoon work traditionally, but I find that more often than not, my best work is rooted in realism when I use traditional as opposed to digital, where I find that I make exceedingly better cartoon work than I do uh, realistic work. Okay. Yeah. There's going to be, like, that's a great idea to keep the style separate, because uh, there's inevitably going to be some kind of leak. But that leak, it's stuff like that that can, like, uh, or crossover. It, it's stuff like that can, that can, like, really inform style. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, I try to apply, like, I'm actually a painter. Like, I, I study painting at university. I do watercolor, which I guess is more towards draftsmanship. Depends on who you're asking. But I f find that, like, all of the watercolor, like, brushes on Procreate and on Photoshop and all of these other ones, they usually just, they don't feel like it. And I know watercolor very well, so when something doesn't feel like it, it's it's evident to see. Yeah. I feel like a lot of that stuff just it just doesn't translate as well as you would hope it would. The watercolor is in like watercolor. It's its own no. brush. Yeah. All right. This kinda helped. I think I'll take some of that to heart. I want to add something, if I may. Mm -hmm. Um this also connects really well into another topic, if I may take a little leap. Because what is really important if you want to keep your passion as an artist on the long run is to have a hobby. As dumb as it sounds, art is not allowed to be 
generally your only thing yeah because that is that is a way of like running low on fuel that is a way of eventually dropping out of the industry after you finally like made that leap made that step gotten good enough so this whole we just make one of those your hobby like it may sound stupid but take that step of separating it as the one thing that you will do professionally and the one thing that you do for you as a healing kind of thing. Yeah. And yeah. Huh. Don't be afraid to call it that because it doesn't make it any less, you know, that's there's a lot of artists. For sculpting. That that. Yeah. Like something that's all the way away from um, like drawing entirely. Like I find that finding an art form where you can still create, but it's yeah. separate from what you normally do. You would be surprised how many professional like concept artists and stuff are actually musicians on the side mm -hmm. because it's creative, but it's on the side and it's not the same. It doesn't cut into their work. You know, there's, some, a, there's a lot. There is some play over though, because like for all the talk on rhythm and and uh, yes, exactly that hey, does translate. I, this is gonna be super dumb, but like I believe you. You you know, I actually really like playing Minecraft. Yeah. <laughs> it actually gets you working in a 3d sort of space That's, <laughs> yes um i was gonna mention a uh, program i work a ton in is uh sketchup uh i've worked a lot in 3d in the past too i've been trained a little bit uh not very i could never get past past uv mapping it's just guys it's so fucking weird to map everything out on two anyway um but through working in 3D, uh, like in 3D mediums, you gain uh, a really intuitive, or you can gain a really intuitive understanding of how shapes are playing with each other in space or with themselves, like playing with themselves. I know I would say that once during this presentation. Uh, Touch yourself. Yeah. I like 3D. I mean, I like SketchUp just over Blender only because I'm more used to using it. But Blender is a, another really good free alternative. Um, but I've, I've been learning to 3D model for VR chat, so that's been an experience. <laughs> <laughs> Blender is pretty decent for it, and it's free as well, so that's a plus. Does well, actually, Blender have a no. 2D thing too? Yes. Oh, yeah, you can animate 2D in it, yeah. What? I wanted to actually ask on that note, because a lot of this stuff is touching into my personal background. Uh, I, I'm i I'm really into art, obviously. I'm on the server, um, and I want to get into it professionally. But I'm also a lot into stuff involving, like, engineering. I take a lot of engineering courses right now where I am. And so I wanted to ask, in, in your guys' opinion, if you think I could take engineering as maybe something I could do hobby wise? Uh, because from my experience, it's always seemed like something that if you go into it, you go into it. Um, well, I'm speaking from someone. Well, I like I'm studying at university to be a professor, right? And I'm in visual arts education with a English education certification. So those are two separate things that I can do. The English education part is usually like something that would have to be every day, something like engineering where it is like you get into it and that is what you're into. But there are plenty of like part time things like that that you can explore, especially if you are transparent with like whoever you're working with on those type of engineering things where you're telling them this is something I want to do part time. There will always like usually you can find someone who is willing to take you on for that. Okay. I think I'd like an opportunity to not necessarily take it all on, but just as a side bid. Yeah. Okay. Hey, yeah. even assistant like positions. That could probably work for engineering. All right. All right. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Okay. So uh, are there any other questions? I'm thinking this is probably a great place to wrap up uh, this initial uh sort of test class uh hope it's gone well for everyone uh but uh, do we have any more questions to, to to wrap up with i have one sure uh since everyone's wrapping up i don't know if one else has a good was a better question but if you could have any superpower what it would be uh 
if you don't, if you're an artist and you don't say X-ray vision, you're not a true artist. I want, I want essentially, I, I want reality bending. So I want everything, <laughs> basically. I want the key. Like, I get all of the, all of the powers at once. This feels like cheating. It sounds like Thanos. <laughs> I need power, reality bending. Um, I actually have something technical, if you will have me. Absolutely. Um, I'd love to ask, how did you make your docked and undocked workspace UIs work that well? Because I've never seen the thing that you made happen with the your subtools on the right side, your pencil, pastel, and stuff. Yeah. That, I've never seen that. Could you, like, run me through it, <laughs> perhaps? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So I like keeping the navigator and the tool palette within like my hands reach, uh, within arms reach on the on the thing, so I can have rotational controls, uh, flip controls, zoom controls, all in one really really fast like quick space. All of these can you can use hotkeys for, um, uh, and hotkeys tend to work better for like the stamping uh, method sort of. So you're like yeah. Uh, uh, for determining like which side something goes on, uh, this is the side that I need to. See. I'm right-handed, so this is the side where I can keep full visual, like visual track of where I am in the hierarchy at all times, uh, without covering it up with my hand. So if it's over here, it won't block my view, um, and I'll be able to like see things out of the corner of my eye like if i'm if i notice that i'm on the wrong i like i can see if i'm on the wrong layer um just by hardly glancing at it uh so it's just it's just quicker um for anything that i need to do quick like uh tool swapping or tool changes for i put it like uh somewhat close to my wrist or um you know uh I can force myself, if I put it over here, I can force myself to use a little bit more arm motion. But uh, it stays over here simply because it, uh, I don't want it to get clicked accidentally or clutter anything up over here. On touch interfaces, this changes. Most of everything gets put on the other side because, like, um, you know, palm rejection hasn't always been so great. So it's kind of been. Uh, I've kind of gotten into the habit whenever I have a palm rejection situation. I usually just clump everything onto the left side so that the right side is totally clean of any accidental clicks. Um, otherwise, most of it just gets shoved over here uh, when I don't have to worry about touching it, uh, just because that's where my hand is. Uh, the color wheel is normally, when it's sketching, it goes away. When, uh, when I need it, it's here. Um, and I sometimes like to have a totally clean view without anything at all. So, um, I'll try to, I'll like minimize, oops, like minimize as much of the interface as possible to get like the largest viewing uh, space possible. And this is what I was talking about with the whole go influences. I'll just, just sit in front of it and spend time with the, with the piece. Um, maybe not even thinking about it, but a lot of a lot of stuff comes from just meditating on it. So I, I like having a mode strictly for it. Uh, tab brings it back all of it at once. That's a quick hide. Uh, you can set up a quick hide with uh, with an element similar to this button. Uh, oh yeah, here it is. So okay, always show tab in Canva. But uh, yeah, it is that this is also customizable. So this this um, this bar up here, uh, where all of these these options are. So like my transform tool is here. Uh, the confirm action or cancel an action. These two up there, uh, really close to tools. So they just kind of become part of the part of the toolbox. Um, Cut, paste, all this stuff. I don't actually use this. This can go because I just use the keyboard shortcuts. So it's just 
what we know better. And then I have all of the submenus here as well. Um, I've kind of stopped using history so much. I, my history is usually tiny. I keep it to a very, very small number of actions just to needlessly maximize every kill of it of, of like uh, processing power for the painting. Um, but also because of kind of like, I'm kind of picking up the idea that I want more of my uh, accidents to become part of the painting. That's another digital haters, uh, like uh, who prefer traditional, or like traditional digital haters, is that uh, uh, you cannot find happy accidents, quote unquote, uh, mistakes that happen during the painting process that ultimately become a compelling part of the overall, of the finished piece. Um, that's a, that happens all the time in digital. Um, and if you can get into sort of the mindset of embracing some of those weird quirks or figuring out how to fix them in the fly without, it, you know, if they don't need to be completely erased or like if you can recognize a positive one while it's happening, that's the real key. Um, but then like history doesn't really get that important. You don't have to, you still get like uh, two or three back and or like a, a good handful of back and forths. But uh, you won't be able to undo a whole like arm or something as you've been drawing it. Um, but like, yeah, I, I don't really believe in relying history on your history palette to undo huge sections of your of your piece or to go super super far back in time. For that, you should be using save states. Um, so making uh, different uh, 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 yeah save files. So. For this would be like Hypatia demo painting two whatever. If you, if you wanted to make a significant like uh, tangential change, and I kind of think of that as being like a, a fork in a, in the timeline in a time movie. It's like if you want to take a painting, uh, you know, to the to the uh, alternative history where uh, uh, what's his face the villain Buff in Biff or whatever in Back to the Future he becomes mayor. And you you make a, sci a file save for the first instance, and if you want to go to the cool future, then yeah, then you can put the two side by side and see which is better. Yeah, I think your your boomer age is showing a little bit. <laughs> what? I think some. Of, yeah, I think your boomer age is showing a little oh my bit. God. I, I, I don't think many of these people have probably. I've never that seen that. The future. You have to see it. Back I've never the seen future it. Is a classic. Look, classic uh, here. Oh my God! Is this happening? Is that Rick and Morty? Like. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Jesus fuck! Oh Jesus! Oh God! My mouth. <laughs> So, okay, before you do, um, so the, it occurred to me, sometimes in a painting, or oftentimes in, like, at least in my painting process, I'll start something and then it kind of, like, I'll discover its meaning as I'm doing it, or it'll change meaning as I'm doing it. And so, like, that can have huge implications in process as well. But for this one, I, I had a special little moment when I realized uh, kind of like a metaphorical aspect of what she's doing, right? And that's kind of what led me to do the whole space girl type uh, theme tangent and use the halomancy thing that uh, is part of the universe I'm building. But uh, so like before I found this server and I found all of these wonderful people and it get mushy, a really bad spot um i did not have like direction or a sense of purpose or uh, anything to sort of like serve as a bouncing off point or yeah anything like that so it was really rough uh freelancing isn't going too well now either especially given you know current events so um if a lot of times in the bad moments and sort of the panicky moments i felt kind of like uh the physical sensation of being choked or like suffocating a little bit. And so like uh, here is basically kind of like, it's kind of like finding the server is kind of like casting, 
casting, uh, you know, an air spell on your head when you're in a vacuum in space. Uh, oh, oh. I see. Yeah, finding that a little bit. Um, being able to breathe, I guess. Yeah, and being able to breathe. And, you know, I live by that um, thing in the airplane safety manual thing. The the statement or the, the the instruction that you should always make sure that your own mask is secure before helping uh, others with theirs. Um, and so like, that's kind of the idea with, it doesn't look like this because it looks like this is, it's flowing this way. And I'm really sad about that, but I don't know how to fix it. But it's, it's supposed to be coming this way into the orb and her offering the orb to all of you. So what I have to offer or painting and in any way that I can help, I will try to help you. That's, that's adorable. Now give me the orb. <laughs> that's very cute. Yay! I'm, I'm going to I'm going to steal the orb. It's a lovely painting, by the way. It's it's very very pretty. I like it a lot. Oh, thank you, and thank y'all for coming today, and thank you for all the questions. Thank you for uh, helping me uh, get to talking and uh, and fill in the dead space. So, uh, hope thank everybody... you for teaching us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you have any more questions or any problems with your own process that you need uh, help with, please come to me directly, uh, or f feel welcome to come to me directly, or pop into like talky chat and like ask for a critique or something. Uh, yeah, or yeah, awesome. purple burb. Purple burb. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm throwing, I'm throwing her underneath the bus a little bit. She's really scared to talk. She's shy. Oh, that's cute. Purple bird. Let me see if I can find the... I had a sketch of this character before. Um... I don't think I did. <laughs> She's got adorable stuff, but she's like, she doesn't want to... She doesn't... Uh, she always feels like super self-conscious. Uh about submitting her stuff for critique, you know, because maybe she thinks that maybe it might not appeal to everybody. Okay. There were some naughty words in there. I am a not safe for work artist. Please do keep that in mind. <gasps> Me too, same. <laughs> so don't pay attention to those. Anyway, okay. Um, again, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think this is going to conclude the, the, the actual demo, so I will... Uh, be taking a bit of a break and then heading down probably over to Taki to, to enter into the evening. So I'll see y'all later. Lee. Okay, thank you. Sure. Have a good break. You too. Thank y'all so much. Ah.